workshop on land pooling policy paradigm for sustainable development we will now be starting with our third session land pooling sharing experience of implementation but before proceeding uh, for our session i would like to make an announcement uh, i would request you all uh, to kindly fill the suggestion form and the feedback form that you got in the bags uh, during the registration kindly give it back to us at the time of receiving certificates I, uh, I now request our esteemed panelists to take the dice. Uh, I would like to call upon stage uh, Mr. R uh, Sri Ravi Agarwal, Sri Tashi Penjor, Dr. Sudha Shreshta, and uh, Ms. Parul Agarwala, and Dr. Pradip Ghosh. And, uh, and Sri P.L. Sharma as well. We will start with our session by the keynote address uh, by uh, Sri Ravi Agarwal. Sri Ravi Agarwal is a chartered accountant by profession. Mr. Ravi Agarwal has been playing a prominent role in his group's success. A young, dynamic, and multi-talented personality, Mr. Agarwal possesses as an excellent communication and interpersonal agility, and has been a great guiding force behind his team's repetitive success. He is a postgraduate diploma holder in business management, specializing in sales, marketing, and finance. Post completion of his chartered accountancy course in 2003, his first assignment was to lead as a head of the NBFS unit from 2000 to 2004. Going forward, he successfully carried out the arbitrage business in financial sector from 2004 to 2008. Under his uh, directorship in 2008, he was responsible for the insurance business and mentored over 3,000 employees. Mr. Agarwal became the co-founder and managing director of Signature, group, uh, Signature Global Group in 2013 and presently takes care of the finance, fundraising, legal, overall business development, planning, sales, and customer relations management of the company. I give the floor uh, to Mr. Ravi Agarwal. Thanks. Good morning, friends. I would like to welcome Sri Tashi Penjur, Chief Urban Planner, Bhutan, Sri Sudhas Rist, Health Development of Architecture, Trivan University, Nepal, Ms. Parul Agarwala, Program Manager, UN Habitat, Dr. Pradipta Ghosh, Distinguished Fellow, Terry, and Mr. P. L. Sharma, and all the attendees present here today. This will turn out to be a special moment where we all are going to discuss the land pooling policy of Delhi, an important decision taken by the government this policy has been to the talk of the town. Many people are talking about its pros and cons. Then there are some who are pointing out towards some issues. The land pooling policy has been used in several cities for government to acquire land for development, such as the Amravati, the planned new capital of bifurcated Andhra Pradesh. Delhi is doing it differently. Instead of government acquiring the bulk of the pooled land and then contracting developers, the state will simply act as a middleman. The Delhi land pooling policy aims to provide 70 lakh homes to the population of around 76 lakh residents in the areas that have been earmarked by the Delhi Development Authority. Drafted by the Develop Authority under the Master Plan 2021, the scheme is only applicable to the city's 95 urban areas. These villages have been divided into five different zones. In my opinion, too, 
this policy was very much needed as many people want to have good housing development in delhi and developers were looking for the land parcels where they can come up with the quality housing solutions now i would like to others to take it forward and lighten us thank you so uh we will now continue with the uh you know with the uh, uh, statements by the by the panelists and i understand that shri pl sharma chief town and country planner amdabad he has to be in the uh, in the ministry of urban uh, ministry of urban development in the morning so i would actually uh, promote him up the up the order and to ask him to speak now and then we will have the other speakers in the same sequence uh, so i see that the that there is supposed to be a tea break at 11:15 we will have the tea break irrespective of who is the speaker at that point in time so uh, so mr sharma you have the floor good morning friends uh dr ghosh uh dignitaries on dais and uh, participants from different states and countries i firstly i thank terry to uh invite me to share my experience uh it's more uh at different levels at field and since 12 years at the state level as chief town planner and uh, for quite some time a joint secretary with the government of gujarat uh, as as on today i am not with the town planning country department but with the gujarat infrastructure development board uh, that's a bit clarification i would like to make i'll share my experiences over a period of 30 years and what gujarat has been doing and uh, i'll be more interested if there are more questions because these experiences what we have would like also to share with others and that was now how did we manage bigger cities eight bigger towns among them uh, on an average 60% of municipal areas are dealt with uh, land pooling Ahmedabad in fact this figures of 159 square kilometers that is uh, presently those are sanctioned schemes but almost 120 square kilometers additional they are under preparation so that will amount to almost uh, 80% of Ahmedabad which will be covered up by land pooling same is the case with uh, Surat Baroda it's a bit less 30 uh, 39 almost 38 square kilometers but again further more steps in gujarat are taken for baroda as well rajkot gandhinagar of course gandhinagar itself was a acquired land this is peripheral uh, periphery of gandhinagar jamnagar is a small town but almost 10 square kilometers and another 20 square kilometers are under planning uh, as of now we can see 30 almost 33% of the land for infrastructure is available through land pooling in uh, bigger cities i mean this is i am talking of bigger cities and uh, from that almost 60% almost 60% area is for circulation spaces and that's where the cities of gujarat are i mean if you see amdavad compared to bangalore or other cities they are quite uh, dense uh, they are not much more spread overall uh, it started a first it started since 2000 uh, 1920 to 30 with four schemes and as on today in 2000 Ten to eighteen in last uh, decade, it is almost fifteen hundred schemes which are fourteen hundred thirty eight schemes which are under progress and four twenty schemes are under uh, planning. What we have done is from hundred hectares to two thousand hectares. The size of TP schemes what we deal well, land pooling in Gujarat we refer as TP schemes. So quite often you will be uh, hearing from my 
uh, words a steep scheme uh, and 25 to 50 percent uh, land is taken for infrastructure and 50 percent is returned 50 to 75 percent is returned that's where the success of Gujarat is we do not intend to compensate but to cooperate cooperate with in terms of business by giving at least 50 percent least is 50 percent we can give more return back uh, more land uh, almost 158 square kilometers across the state we have acquired through land pooling for infrastructure why Gujarat land pooling is effective to start with it is cooperation not compensation that's where the difference is compensation be, uh, basically doesn't give trust and others gain who loses and remaining people uh, I mean others gain but the losers are 100% losers that's where the difference is and whatever land which is retained has wealth it is wealth generation from for them that's why it creates business opportunities and most uh, uh, I mean most enable uh, better part is for Gujarat is we have a robust legislation from 1915 then we amended Bombay Town Planning Act in 1955 then 1976 Gujarat Town Planning Act came into and since Gujarat 76 we have modified almost 14 times and last modification presently it is under the uh, progress the bill has been proposed to the government and again will be modifying why these modifications are there it started with infrastructure development improvement of uh, areas in 1915 and now we are into creating wealth and business in 19, uh, 2019 that's where the modifications and act are required and uh, that the government i mean government of gujarat almost every time wherever required is making modification uh, i mean since its inception it was planning planned finance and planned implementation those all three aspects are covered up uh, i mean Normally planning is separated and then budgetary allocation leads to finance and the planning and plan implementation is left out alone. Gujarat Act has all three components which effectively uh, deals with the authorities deal with it. Then micro level planning issues are there and macro level also comprehensive infrastructure development is also taken place. Then this most important is it's a cost center approach. Every TP scheme or a land pooling uh, project itself is a cost center i mean whatever earnings you have that is consumed in those areas only the budgetary allocation uh, normally in a project in a municipal area the budget allocations are done and certain areas are deprived and other areas to get bu proper budgetary allocation but in case of gujarat the uh, gujarat act very clearly says it's a cost center approach and it has to be uh, developed it's pragmatic, fair, and equitable. Property rights of every owner, including a beneficiary, are uh, taken care. Costs are distributed and benefits are also shared. That makes this more uh, cooperative attitude. Uh, pub public inputs, I mean, of course, it has been referred that Gujarat TP schemes are taking very long time. In many cases, it has taken, I mean, it's uh, nothing wrong to confess, it has taken almost three to four to five years also. But no issue is left out once it is completed. No title issues, no encroachments, no, no such issues which uh, really uh, keeps uh, infrastructure projects at uh, B. Then it's a versatile tool to achieve different objects. I'll take up that in the testing. Now, how it's not that Ahmedabad, the few cities it is still, we deal with uh, uh, for f less than 50 lakh population to uh, Ahmedabad, 60 lakh population. Same tool used for uh, Kutch, uh, which where it was devastated, uh, I mean the towns were devastated in 2001 earthquake. Every uh, town was rebuilt by using the, this tool. In coastal areas, uh, uh, cyclonic uh, storms are there those are different areas where again we are dealing with TP schemes same thing is in the southern Gujarat uh, where you have flood prone areas they are also dealt with the same tool and uh, of course Ahmedabad which is high uh, growth area that is also dealt with now flexibility we have taken up ring roads smaller roads also 
all utility services like water supply treatment plants sewage treatment plants all services are taken up through land pooling redevelopment retrofitting of uh, and um, uh, retrofitting for high density areas also taken up in case of Ahmedabad uh, land pooling and land local area plan two tools used for retrofitting for from 1 1.8 FSI today it is uh, plus 5 FSI it is dealt through this land pooling there we are using it uh, more uh, local area plan also not only land pooling but eastern Ahmedabad where uh, there were high level of encroachments illegal constructions no infrastructure roads were there they were opened up through TP schemes uh, and uh, these areas were dealt with and same thing is in case of uh, Kutch after the earthquake uh, cities were dealt by I mean they totally uh, shattered three feet streets were widened to 60 uh, 20 feet and and that we made safe habitation over there. Then project specific riverfront development, Kakaria uh, front development, these are a few examples. I am not giving all examples, but these are a few examples where project specific project related uh, land pooling has been done. Then land consolidation, one of the classic examples, someone who must have visited you know, Pandit Din Dayal University in Gandhinagar. That's a classic example where a university land was carved out through a TP scheme. Of course, there are other examples in case of Surat Baroda uh, where land consolidation. And uh, last to say, housing, I mean, entire housing program in Gujarat, whatever funds are coming from central government, the government of India, they are being uh, consumed and the land is available through land pooling in our urban areas. Uh, we do not have more experience for rural areas, but we are all dealing with and of course Gujarat present it is 43% and it is going to increase more than 50% in uh, short term. So that's where these tools would be useful. Now it's not that we do not have problems. There are many, I mean these are the challenges what we face. Uh, it's a demand driven process, so we cannot have TP schemes easily in urban areas where there is no demand. In our far flung areas, we have experienced that TP uh, land pooling was done and ultimately we had to withdraw those uh, schemes. Now, from 100 to 300 hectares, and for the uh, city level, uh, we need, uh, I mean, uh, we, the TP schemes have to be drafted out, carved out in a manner that you can accommodate uh, larger areas. So, the identification of area and size is one of the criteria which could. Uh, which which deals one at the project level and the level of uh, beneficiaries which has to be proportionately dealt with that that's where the skills are required where high I mean different caste based uh, systems are there I mean of, uh, there are communities low uh, high income group communities that heterogeneous character also has to be taken care of while uh, drafting uh, carving out the areas of RTP schemes. Um, and housing typology equally. Uh, uh, then another, what we don't do is we do not take, of course the act doesn't prevent, but we do not incorporate railway defense areas or areas which are uh, protected. And, uh, uh, and another is uh, this is the Gamtal, what we call as downtown areas as Gamtals in Gujarat and water bodies, they are also left out. It is to retain the character of the scheme. And, more, most important, many litigations have happened for, for the boundaries of TP scheme. Carefully, uh, I mean, if it is not drafted carefully, uh, care is not taken for, in, for uh, delineating the boundary, there are problems which are occurring. Then, most important is accuracy in mapping. I mean, just because of inaccurate maps. Uh, in the, the time of uh, start of the TP scheme, it leads to several issues and that uh, whatever I referred about to four to five years some TP schemes have taken, that's primarily because of mapping and the cadastral maps and ownership records. I mean, here we do not, the I'll, I'll make it clarify the TP schemes or land pooling of Gujarat do not alter anything, any, any aspect of ownership's records. Whatever ownership records which are there in the original land, they are conti they continue to be in the reconstituted plots. If there are disputes which are lying in the original land, the disputes continue to be in the final uh, plot also. But 
the prime primary cause is primary uh, aspect to be taken care is that one should not lose out any beneficiary or any person or any uh, owner or i mean occupier whosoever maybe uh, while addressing is taking his grievance now that's more important and uh, Uh, second is ownership beneficiary ratio owner and beneficiary relationships that is also more important many times the cost or compensation to the loss of land of 40 50% whatever one loses that ultimately that goes to the beneficiary not to the owner i mean that's uh, i'll make it clarify in many cases yesterday there were uh, instances which has happened where uh, the, this was one of the question which was raised also that who goes who gets the um th- this thing compensation and uh, of course most important what uh, we experience is small parcels in one tp scheme having smaller parcels and larger parcels again there are issues you deal with a person who is having uh, 100 hectares i mean uh, uh, 10 hectares of land and another person who is having 1000 hect- uh, square meters that discrepancy ultimately leads to uh, i mean issues which uh, it's difficult to uh, and deal with then uh, this is uh, now allocation of final plots allocation of final plots meaning after 40% deduction the layout is created uh, where the final plots are been allocated now that is uh, always has been issue uh, that are charges of corruption also there are charges of uh, in improper uh, imperative which has been uh, maintained the shape size location are also these are i mean these are the aspects which basically these days we have started taking not the uh, i mean the deduction but the equitable potential deductions the, the shape size and location ultimately leads to potential creation or potential loss uh, these are the skills which we have generated i mean we uh, in town planning department of gujarat has almost 400 planners uh, they are all trained properly trained to deal with because ultimately they are the people who are going to uh, deliver on the ground so they are been taught how to deal with these subjects then i mean normally it has been felt that more and more land uh, goes to government in many cases in haryana i believe it is 70% 70 to 75% land has been taken Uh, in many other cases 50% but more land allocation for infrastructure to uh, the local authority is again a problem appropriate land is right we should not over emphasize having more and more land for infrastructure but appropriate land that's where we are uh, i mean the upper limits for gujarat is 40 to 50% maximum no in no cases we have exceeded 50% except in surat one uh, one case we had gone to 60% but uh, uh, that's where appropriate infrastructure and the land allocation has to be taken care of then inclusivity and participatory approach which uh, perhaps one of the classic example is of amravati where the i mean the inclusivity and participatory process has been at a very of a very high order gujarat we are not having much more of that but definitely um i mean we are do we don't face trouble because we are experience having tp schemes since uh, more than 100 years so people have accepted that more participatory approach uh, is not dealt with but nevertheless in last 5 6 years this is increasing and uh, gujarat is also learning from amravati how to deal with uh, uh, in- inclusivity yeah. then most important is valuation gujarat has uh, is fortunate to have town planning and uh, and valuation in a, with one department uh, gujarat state town planning valuation department deals with valuation of government lands as well as town planning of the uh, cities that's where valuation is one of the most important where the compensation assessment and the enhanced value of the uh, uh, this thing which is land which has been returned to the owner this is also one of the i mean a f- few cases are pending with uh, supreme court also in case of gujarat where this is also challenged and uh, since the lara act which has come into uh, this uh, which is already there so it has been equated with that and there are issues with 
uh, land valuation. But of course, uh, once we say that the land pooling creates business opportunities, that's where Gujarat, no one is interested in compensation. Uh, the value of the remaining land is much, much more higher than what the compensation is received. That's where I was referring, we start with cooperation, not compensation. So Gujarat is not facing much trouble with compensation, but of course, valuation is one of the most important. At times it is equated with the LARA Act and then uh, we are having trouble also. Then, uh, yes, uh, Gujarat has, uh, as present 420 TP schemes are uh, in place at different 56 offices in the state. Uh, we have a strong manpower to deal with legal issues. There are more than 500 cases which are pending just for the land pooling uh, before the High Court. But uh, uh, the Act is quite robust. Uh, from whatever cases we deal in the High Court, we barely lose. It's the courts would interpret that it should be the town planning officers or the government should uh, do proper hearing. They should listen to the owner. I mean, and many times the system is so, uh, I mean, uh, inherent that people do not listen to the owners and the officers do not care for them. Those cases are opening up because of that. The sensitivity of the officers at the lo lower level is quite uh, they, they are not, uh, I mean, they are, uh, they are quite insensitive about the subject and, and uh, this is because of the lack of experience. Uh, unfortunately, um, Gujarat for almost 15 years, there was no appointments. So, continuity of those uh, training on the job training has lacking. But those uh, states are, uh, who would be dealing with land pooling, for them this is one of the most important subject. I mean, manpower, without manpower, nothing will happen and you will end up all uh, uh, cases. Uh, timely finalizing and sanctioning. I mean, this is many times it so happens from uh, 300 owners, so, uh, parcels of land. One parcel of land owner that keeps on creating trouble till the TB scheme gets sanctioned by the government. So that is uh, timely finalizing. I mean, you need to give opp opportunity, but not the, uh, the opportunity to the highest order that he keeps on pestering you till the TP scheme gets uh, to the uh, for the sanction to the uh, chief minister. The then quasi judicial officers uh, uh, officers for the decision making timely completion. I'm mean, there also. Same thing is happening. Uh, many officers become too sensitive to deal with. Many officers are too insensitive. In both the cases, uh, they are having problems. The manpower management, of course, is most important. At least in case of Gujarat, where we have 50 towns uh, which are de dealing with EB schemes, uh, separate areas with 50, uh, less than 50,000 population to 50 lakh plus population. Uh, then updating of revenue records, of course, this is necessary. But here in Gujarat, we don't deal with, uh, the, I mean, like, uh, yesterday it was been discussed that land records as a as a mission is to be taken up the, by the state i mean that will never happen at least 100 hectares you improve records you incorporate in land pooling go ahead with it that's the that's the way which we are doing uh, we don't uh, look for entire ahmedabad the records are ahmedabad is 1200 square kilometers Auda area we are not trying to improve the entire records of 1200 hectares i mean square kilometers I mean, as and when you require land pooling, you start with it, improve 100 hectares, 200 hectares, and then uh, things at least, revenue department also has uh, the, uh, per, uh, that much manpower only to deliver that job. That's why it's a balanced approach. Then timely demarcation, handing over of the final plots. Again, if we do not do, uh, implement the schemes, then again, demarc uh, encroachments would happen. That is also one of the most important aspects. I mean, the good planning, but worst implementation leads to nothing. And that's where one has to take care also. Then uh, this certificate of tenureship that is uh, Gujarat specific, I'll not go into more details. Then timely monetization. I mean, this is most important. Like 15, uh, almost uh, 6 to 7 percent land is available for uh, sale to all the authorities. But experience says that 
including Ahmedabad Development Authority, they do not dispose the land. Ultimately, what for this land is to create infrastructure. Today, uh, almost uh, uh, 30 square kilometers of area is for the purpose of sale with different authorities. And experiences in Gujarat are they, um, to deal with pri uh, government land to dispose is very difficult. I mean, they are not well experienced. That's where every officer would see that uh, during his tenure, he should not sell it. And the subsequent officer would deal with the subject. And always there are uh, challenges in, I mean, those are um, uh, allegations are there to, to, to people are. But most important is timely disposal, whatsoever matter. We have the land disposal policy also. And last is Gujarat has almost four almost 4,000 plots which are there with the authorities, almost 3,000 plots are with the uh, Ahmedabad and Surat itself. Asset management is one of the biggest they take on having the land. They do not manage the assets and ultimately encroachments do happen. Now that's what I wanted to say and uh, with that I would expect, these are my experiences which I have shared and I would expect the questions uh, if any. Thank you, Mr. Sharma, for this very comprehensive and in insightful account of the experience of land pooling in Gujarat. Now, I'm sure the participants have many questions to ask from Mr. Sharma, and I hope he has a few minutes to be able to address your, your comments and questions. So the floor is open. Please raise your hand, identify yourself, and, and pose your question or comment to Mr. Sharma. Yes, please, this lady there. Good morning, sir. Good morning, all of you. So, uh, sir, I have... Yeah, please identify yourself. Okay, my name is Gurpreet Kaur. I am from AMDA, Association of Municipalities and Development Authorities. So, sir, I have two questions. Yeah. So, the first question is, uh, you said that in Gujarat, it's more about cooperation rather than compensation. Yeah. So, I, I have a question on this line only that for example I, I have a parcel of land in an urban area so in, just in order for a corporation I wouldn't give it to uh, for a land pooling thing but there has to be something related to the compensation because yesterday we had this uh, a, a presentation by a commissioner of the capital regional uh, APCRDA and he told us that they have compensated through commercial plot as well as residential plots and they also giving some uh, 2,500 per month pension to those who who are willing to give up their land in the land pooling scheme. So I just want to understand what Gujarat is doing for the people who are putting their land in the uh, in this land pooling scheme. So uh, this is the first question. Uh, I'll uh, come back to the second question later if you answer this. Yeah, question. you see, firstly, uh, Gujarat it's a tool. It's yeah. not a single project. Amravati, it's one case they have started. Gujarat is an experience of more than 100 years. And it has been used in case of every location from 50,000 square, uh, 50 lakh population to 50 lakh plus population. And we do not give opportunity to any person that they say they have their individual say. Yes, if 75% of the owners do not want a scheme, then the scheme will not happen. It's not that 75% should come forward and say that TP scheme should come. Like in case, of for, for example, if 4 to 5% people say that they do not want to cooperate, no, they have to be in that land pooling scheme by legislation, right? Only thing is the, the level of uh, the uh, com contribution for the purpose of infrastructure, that land contribution, that can be uh, plus and minus. But no person, if it is within the boundary, delineated, has a liberty to go out of the scheme or have his own wishes. Yes, all of them come together, 75% of them, and they say, no, we do not want a scheme. That Then only the TP scheme gets. That's what the cooperative... Uh, cooperation is like everyone is gaining wealth why should a few people should uh, I mean uh, be the deterrent of the commonwealth which is doing so 
but what will be the co compensation? Compensation, every square meters of land is compensated. Like we in do in case form? of, yes. In, in what form? In, in terms of uh, money, there is no in compensation in terms of, like we do not deal with TDR. Mm -hmm. This is not a project oriented exercise. This is a tool where it can be compensated in terms of money, right? For example, if a road is to be widened later on, then the municipal corporation is empowered to uh, compensate in terms of TDR. But as of now, when all 100% are being compensated through money, uh, two others cannot be compensated for uh, TDR. Yes, once the land pooling is over, and then one corporation is willing, the local development authority is thinking that they need to widen it, then compensation can be given uh, uh, that is out of the land pooling scheme right? through TDR so, also. So, if we are talking about giving them the money in terms of compensation and that is uh, based on the, the, the new act, 2013 act? No, we, uh, we have 1969 judgment of seven bench, seven judges panel of Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which clearly says the land compensation which is assessed in land pooling uh, scheme of Gujarat is not to be equated with the land acquisition. Okay, sir. Because so the, 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 the difference is you are returning back 50% land. Mm -hmm. So he is gaining wealth on that 50% land. And the uh, deduction, whatever he compensates, He's, he's compensated at, at par with all. So that, that classic judgment of uh, seven bench saves us. They, it has stated clearly that the, both the acts, uh, I mean the Town Planning Act of Gujarat is never to be equated with uh, land uh, acquisition of 1849 and subsequently this also. Right? Okay, sir. Sir, my second question to you is regarding uh, this uh, redevelopment of downtown area. So, I yeah. just want to understand what downtown mean here. Is this slums and this water settlements we are talking about or something else? Uh, so, downtown means uh, the the hamlets which used to be there, the, the unorganic for organic form of development which used to be there where the, the village site starts. Right? That is what we refer as Gamtal, so downtown the, the, area. The Laldora yeah. area? Laldora. Laldora area, yes, yes, specifically similar to that. All right, okay, yeah. sir. All right, yeah. then fine. But that uh, in, in case of Kutch, we have dealt those uh, downtown areas also through land pooling. All right, yeah. sir. Because I just want to know about the uh, ownership uh, status there in the downtown areas, that who are really the owners? Because sometimes... You see, firstly... The land, uh, land Town Planning Act of Gujarat is very clear. You reconstitute the plots. You are not dealing with anything related so to ownership. Readjustment. Readjustment. Right? That's where whatever ownership is prevalent in the uh, original plot, it continues to be there in the final plot. Right? Okay, sir. Yeah. okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, please. I am from DDA. I am uh, Dr. Meena Vidhani, Deputy Director Planning. Uh, I had just two specific queries uh, regarding the scheme. First is, it uh, we mentioned it is applicable uh, in many areas, uh, uh, in existing areas, but we also mentioned we avoid greenfield areas. But I think TP schemes are also being used for development of the outer ring roads, etc. So in that case, I'll, yeah. I'll clarify greenfield meaning non-contiguous areas, right. fringe areas where potentiality of growth is there and uh, ring roads, Ahmedabad is a classic example of ring roads. Yeah, so in the that particular schemes keep on increasing, the expansion happens uh, that way only. Okay. Uh, but it is, we have also lost in many cases, we could not uh, implement the schemes okay. which, has, which had been taken almost for 5 kilometers away, 10 kilometers away from the development, it was not a fringe area. <laughs> Okay. So that's no, what actually, the sir, difference The challenge is. which I am uh, anticipating when we are looking at our policy also is that for the uh, uh, ring roads, we need a continuous availability of land. It cannot happen in the parts. Yeah. And if that is the case, and if we are saying the maximum we are returning them is 50%. Mm. So uh, there, the road requires 100% land for the road. So in that case, how do we actually go about doing that? You see, because there are two ways of doing it. Like, uh, uh, Ahmedabad the ring road was not a problem because 
they, at that time the confidence level with the, the then chairman and the owners of the plots was very high the relationship was very high and it could be taken up now once that ring road is open the areas have opened for development and the potentiality is there the people are ready to surrender but the example what you are referring is in case of surat okay. then what we have done is that you plan a uh, land pooling uh, uh, schemes in those areas you have to wait for some time till the potentiality gets created right? i mean you either create a potentiality or have a land pooling in a created way, I mean, uh, potential areas mm -hmm. without business no one is going to allow you to do that mm -hmm. now one other uh, uh, suggestion was there for surat also you don't build 90 percent 90 uh, 90 uh, this thing meters wide ring road 100 percent you start with a small patch of maybe 10 meters acquire that land let the value increases then you implement the scheme you don't need to acquire 90 percent at one go <laughs> and that remaining 80 meters you can acquire through land pooling also that that dual approach also can be done but, but in case of surat what we have done is that we have we we uh, publish this scheme, draft scheme, then we are waiting. Now that potentiality is high, now the acceptability of the TP scheme is also high. But in that case also we are able to return them the, uh, the their plot, I mean their share of return, yes. we are able to give them. Yes, yes. We are able to give them within the scheme. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. The no return issue. of the final plots Does is it? possible in every case. Okay. Like the point is that if 75% owners do not want a scheme, they can uh, then the TP scheme can be can be withdrawn, right. and that is also at a very la later stage. At upfront, no, nothing, no one is allowed to go out of that area. Right. So right? The second one, Isha, the court cases that were mentioned that we have around 500 on. If you could just elaborate as to what are the major reasons for these court cases, like what are the issues which are uh, the problem areas in implementing? I mean, see. You, no one says not a single court case is there where a person wants to go out of the scheme. Okay. Second is if it is in a joint ownership, the owner uh, they, they go to the court asking that they should be given separate final plots. Now that's a business of revenue department to separate it. It's, it's not the town planning department who deals with it. Right, right. That is another example. Okay. Third, most prevalent, sixty percent of the cases either the notice has been served and that fellow doesn't receive that is insensitivity of the officers 90 percent cases are of that nature okay. uh, you are not concerned about the person i mean a poor fellow with uh, i mean uh, sl uh, uh, sling a bag he will not able to enter the office such people uh, many times they he will sell it to someone else and then later on the developer comes in and he would bargain through a court case uh, that his land should be given in a better location or those are the, I mean, majority, they want more potential areas where the location should be there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I am uh, Madhusudan. Uh, is, uh, please, please, your, ident uh, please identify yourself and then ask yeah, question. Yeah, I am Madhusudan. I work on land acquisition and resettlement issues. I'm a practitioner basically. So I just wanted to understand the concept of your SIR region that was developed and this uh, concept of your cooperation and uh, no compensation. Has it been the same kind of uh, this thing you have adopted for the special investment region in uh, Dolera and things like that? Are the same things and what are the problems that you faced in implementing that particular thing because it's delayed way beyond the uh, expectation? Yeah, you are right. SIR was the first example, Dolera SIR, which, has, which, which presently I deal with in the new capacity uh, where uh, schemes were taken up to the extent of uh, three square kilometers, four square kilometers, very large schemes were there. There was no potentiality. I mean, the, the, the growth potential was zero almost. Now, you the flip side of the story is that many people made money out of it also. The land values shot up almost 50 to 60 times, not less, but 60 times. But Dolera happens to be an area where 30% land is government land. From the total area, 30% land is government. And uh, re remaining 70%, 35% again is uh, taken through land pooling, which comes into the government coffers. 35% is only there. Now, that marginalization of uh, private land holding 
is yielding to land shortage. Ultimately, government land disposal is difficult. And government has to invest money. Right? Whereas that marginalization has led to the shortage of land, marketable land. That has led to more increase in values. And what ultimately TP scheme does is increment in value. We have achieved that. Rather than, I mean, and that too again, with the passage of time, what was I was referring to uh, Ma'am's uh, answer. Uh, same thing, you wait for some time. Land values, at least in Gujarat, increase many fold times once you uh, declare an area to be in a land pooling scheme. That's why we don't face trouble. Dolera case, of course, initial resistance was there. That's where the, uh, it was decided that no incremental contribution will be asked to, uh, the owners will not be asked to pay uh, incremental contribution. Only compensation would be there. Uh, but the compensation was also meager with respect to what the land values would have increased. I mean, if you happen to be in Dolera, I mean, the, you know the cases. It's a uh, classic case. That's where now there is no resistance. Of course, and more more problem point is you are marginalized the land holdings that's where uh, the issue has been dealt that way but by and large gujarat deals with managing and the land through land holding sizes i mean if you marginalize them the land uh, would uh, otherwise the value would increase thank you yes please I'm Ankita, uh, project associate at Terry. So I have a question. Uh, what lessons can the development authorities that are going for land pooling uh, learn from Gujarat? See, Gujarat, uh, firstly, it should be considered as a practice and a tool, not a project oriented. Like we can create Amravati once. You cannot replicate. Gujarat has an experience of replicating it. That one should understand. And replication leads to better creating better, I mean, uh, manage the cities, which ultimately every state will have 30%, uh, 30 to 50, 60% of land in urban areas. And that's where uh, we are more concentrating on urban areas. Gujarat is not much more uh, dealing with rural areas. That's where replication is one of the most thing. How do we deal with 50,000 less population uh, city and the 60 lakh plus population? We do not have same people. I mean, as well, I was in the town time department. We never used to, uh, I mean, appoint officers also from uh, Ahmedabad to, to a city which is of a smaller town. Both have their own experience. I mean, the, the, the political uh, the structure in the local town is a small town is much more sensitive. I mean, the decision making is difficult. Whereas in case of Ahmedabad, you take any decision, it's uh, acceptable everywhere. And uh, same thing is in case, I mean, Gujarat has varied culture. If you go to Saurash, uh, you will not, they do not believe in uh, multi, I mean, multi-level uh, housing, uh, uh, group housing. They do not, they, they are, uh, they believe in having their own plots. He will own himself, develop. The, the character of housing, the typology of housing also changes. And accordingly, and... Uh, the the uh, Saurash again has that uh, it was a drought prone area. The people's uh, attitude is also something which they would not like to share that land. So, I mean, you start 50% policy of uh, uh, land allocation, uh, it won't work. You have to start with 20%, 30%. I mean, that's where I was referring. The land allocation for infrastructure should be appropriate. I mean, if I stuck, uh, I mean, keep in mind that as an urban planner, I require this much of land for this purpose. It never works. It never works. So that's where, whereas in case of Surat, they are more interested in delivery business. So they have surrendered 60% land also. And the examples are both in Gujarat. In case of uh, post earthquake rehabilitation, we have taken up only 5% land. I mean, the, the objective for which 40% or 50% is no sacrosanct. I mean, how, why you deal with the land area, uh, I mean, the land pooling, the objectives should be attained more than the land allocation. I mean, ultimately, more the land you own, the government owns, you have to put in more money. I mean, it's better uh, they develop also come, uh, the private partic uh, sector participation should be much more. 
Oops. Okay. Hi, good morning. This is Anil Sharma. I'm from National High Speed Rail Corporation. As we, we are dealing uh, a lot of issues uh, in Gujarat. So I have two questions for you. Specifically, when you uh, bring people, you know, uh, the main question is to the valuation of land, actually, you know. When you do the town planning, you acquire, you involve all the people having land in that particular areas, right? Irrespective of the nature of the land. That may be a dry land, you know, it cannot be cultivated. A good land, which is maybe cultivated thrice in a year also. So how you do the uh, valuation of that land? Because you, uh, you may have the grievances in that regard that you bring all the people on the same platform. Because once you develop that land and the nature will change of the land, then the cost will be almost same. But how you deal with that? And another one is, uh, as you mentioned that uh, TP schemes are developed and the rates are shoot up with that, right? As you announce the TP schemes. But we are still facing a lot of problem in sewer where you announce the TPs, they were never being implemented. The situation of ground is as uh, earlier as uh, 10, 15 years back when you uh, announced those schemes. They are still living in rural conditions. And uh, as far as you said that the rate may be a little bit higher side, but the provisions we have in the law right now for acquisition that the multiplication factor in urban areas, because once the TP scheme is announced, they consider un under the urban areas, will be one instead of two. So they are in lending up getting much lesser compensation in comparison to the adjoining villages. Those are not declared as a TP. Then how you will deal with those conditions? You see, firstly, I am discussing about urban expansion and urban areas. Uh, there is a sort of mix in your question also. You, are, you wanted to get an answer about land acquisition through LARA valuation and uh, the vis-a-vis -vis what we have, uh, the land pooling scheme. Firstly, land pooling valuation is not a concern because I referred about 1969 judgment. It clearly has stated that any valuation done in land pooling is not to be associated with Land Acquisition Act. Right? So that's where we, the and, and the 50 percent or 30 percent of whatever land you return back to the owner, he's gaining benefits out of it because the more land he gains, the more value uh, the land what he retains is gaining much much more higher. That's where I was referring that uh, outer ring road of Surat is yet not developed because it will be an appropriate time and it will be opened. I mean, it's not a uh, case which will be. So my, now, my question is that, that you bring 10 people on a same platform, one people own a land which is having a more market value or having more potential in terms of irrigation and other stuff, right? Another one is having much, much lesser on that. And if you want to bring all of them on the same table by putting even giving the developed land, are they ready for this? Or you you may be getting you know, a lot of grievances. We are also getting, we are also trying to I bring am, them there. I'm coming to that point only. I'm coming to that point. Once a TP scheme is declared in a fringe area or with for the purpose of urban development, that those aspects of retaining it for the purpose of agriculture or for the purpose of um, uh, this thing, uh, any other any other activity which is non-urbanizable area, that the owner himself is in, in back of the frame of mind. You see, second point is that he is not interested in agriculture production. He is interested in generating wealth because of TP scheme. That's where we have never ever faced such trouble of valuation linked with his uh, cultivability or for that whatever assets, cult, agriculture assets he had in this his own land, that issues are not been there. Uh, second is, second point is we also have a board of appeal for that matter. Whosoever wants to go, he can go to that board of appeal instead of going in the high court. But I'll, I'll inform you that since last 10 years, there are no cases in the board also. That's where it's just an apprehension that 
there is, there is likely because you face trouble because you are dealing with Lara Act. There a person loses 100%. You compensate for the purpose of his uh, uh, livelihood. You compensate for, for the purpose of his land loss. You compensate for many reasons. That's why I started my presentation that we are not dealing with compensation. We are dealing with cooperation. Cooperative development is the key to success of Gujarati peace scheme. It's not compensation. No one ever bothers about and the and I mean uh, you can go and ask in the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation, which has the largest number of schemes. They have never paid a single rupee for compensation because no person comes forward. Also, I mean, and that's a belief that in Gujarat. I mean, I mean, sorry to say, but many officers feel that you get free of cost land, but free of cost land is not there. It's there that you compensate, but the extent of compensation is not challenged and it used to be challenged earlier. That is also been set aside uh, by the Supreme Court's uh, judgment, which we, we have used that judgment since, for, I mean, in my career of 35 years, I've used that judgment for several times and no courts have intervened till date. Because the, the basic is you are not compensating, you are cooperate, asking them to cooperate in the scheme for the purpose of development. That's the difference which is there. Well, and at the same time, uh, in, in case of Amravati also, more and more aspects about compensation, either in terms of skill development you help or either in terms of any uh, livelihood improvement you do deal with. Everywhere compensation aspect is there. But it, you can deal that way for as a project. You cannot deal with uh, in the similar manner for as a tool which can be applied for uh, varied cities and varied uh, thing, size of towns. Uh, yes, perhaps please. I could... Let it in. Uh, good morning. I am uh, Asim Bazaar Chari from Triban University, Nepal. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, is there anything uh, defined as the minimum size of the plot that can be plotted. And what if uh, there are the cases where during the course of the deduction, the new size happens to be less than the, the minimum threshold? Thank you. You see, yes, it's a right, good question. Uh, in Kutch, we I have dealt a, a, land, a land pooling scheme, but it was six square meters. Six square meters is almost, I mean, uh, one tenth of this room also. I mean, that's the size we have dealt with, where we had deducted only for the purpose of deduction 3%, that he should also compensate. Second, in case of Ahmedabad, we have minimum size as 1500 square meters in the zonal plan, where we have 100% compensated. He has not been given a single square meter of land. Right? That way, as per the situations, in the regulations, development control regulation, you have prescribed that this is the size of plot which should be there. Now, if though if the, this land pooling scheme falls in that area, so that is the minimum size you should give it. Or if it is not, then don't give it. Both ways. It is not uh, sacrosanct that you deduct 40 percent. You can reduce that 40 to 20 percent and give him this size of plot. Ultimately, he is going to pay incremental contribution. The more he re retains, he is to pay more. I mean, we feel that it's the other way around. The more he, more reduction means it's a more loss to the, I mean, government also. Government is also supposed to put in money. I mean, that's a balance which has been struck up. Uh, I mean, if, if, I, if we try to do it in uh, Saurash, we are not able to do that for 50 percent, uh, 40 percent also. Yeah. Hello, I'm Dr. Malavika Paul. I teach economics at Miranda House, Delhi University. My question to you is again regarding valuation. Uh, I've been working on the Land Acquisition Act for a long time and I find that most of the court cases are related to compensation. So this cooperation versus compensation thing is quite interesting in case of Ahmedabad. So I would like to know what proportion of land in terms of square meters or whatever has been acquired or pooled basically with this policy where cooperation has worked. And secondly, I would like to know what is the exact uh, content of the 1969 judgment because that seems to be quite revolutionary because uh, based on that, uh, people are not coming to court and all that. And uh, thirdly, the question is that is, isn't there any particular method of valuation or is it just case by case basis as far as uh, this uh, pooling is concerned? Thank you. See. Uh almost 80% of Ahmedabad is developed through land pooling, right? And uh, perhaps 
one or two percent land acquisition should, could have been done in Ahmedabad through land acquisition and that too most of it is done through compensatory FSI, TDR or compensatory FSI has been given. That is where we do not have trouble while expanding the, widening the existing roads, right? Because the extent of TDR which has been given or the compensatory FSI is very less in terms of the total market, uh, FSI in the market. That is why we do not have trouble in those cases. Uh, second point is that, you see, I told in the upfront also that it is everyone, the, the scheme is for everyone. Authority is the custodian of that uh, area. Authority holds the land as a custodian of that area. It's the it's a cost center approach. The money which comes has to be utilized there. That builds in confidence also. And second uh, point is that the the valuation what we do there is also similar based on the sale instance method only. But we do not adopt the exact methodology what used to be there in Land Acquisition Act of 1894, neither the case of uh, this the present Lara Act. That, that has been specified. Now, 69 judgment clearly says that if an owner is returned back the land off to the to some, to some extent, 50%, 40%, 60%, whatever, he is gaining some wealth out of it and he is contributing. It is not an acquisition. Where That is where the the differentiation between land pooling of Gujarat and land acquisition, he is contributing for, for the purpose of common interest for the cooperative development of that area. And that is what has been specified in 69 judgment also. So I think we will have to uh, stop here. So thank you thank very much, Mr. Sharma, for uh, thank you, coming sir. and you know, giving us this very insightful uh, talk. And also for your, you know, very, uh, uh, very careful and patient response to these questions. I mean, I think some of these questions were, were excellent questions indeed. And I would actually encourage you to work with our colleagues and you know, produce a paper on, uh, you know, on on your presentation, which we can, you know, publish as part of the proceedings of this of this conference. Sure. Okay. And so I wish you all all success in your endeavors now with the Ministry of Urban Development. Thank you, sir. I would now, uh, now like Dr. Pradipto Ghosh to kindly give uh, the token of appreciation to Shri P. L. Sharma. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I would like to call upon uh, stage uh, Mr. Tashi Penjor. Mr. Tashi Penjor is Officiating Director of Department of Human Settlement, Ministry of Works and Human Settlement, Royal Government of Bhutan. Besides, he also works as Chief Urban Planner for the same department. He has been engaged in drafting of legislation, regulations, guidelines and standards related to human settlements, preparation of national, regional and local spatial plans, carrying out research, studies and analysis of urban development trends and issues and providing technical assistance to the local governments on human settlement planning and development. In addition, Mr. Penjor has carried out design and implementation of architectural, planning and landscape projects having national significance. He is a board director of Woodcraft Center Limited, DHI owned company. He also engages and works in the holistic community growth and development through noble initiative of Tarayana Foundation. I now invite Sir to kindly share his experience and insights with the audience. Very good morning to all. Moderator of the session, Dr. Ghosh, distinguished panelists, 
distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, uh, I'm highly honored to be able to share some of Bhutan's experience, but at the same time, very humbled. Why? Because this, the scale, the magnitude, and the intensity of our experiences, indeed, will be of not much of uh, an importance given the magnitude and scale in India. However, I would still continue to share some of our experiences. Indeed, in fact, uh, it has been quite similar to what I have been hearing from the past speakers. Well, uh, it is also important uh, for our colleagues here to understand the human settlement planning and development concept per se in the Kingdom of Bhutan to establish a platform on understanding the land pooling and land readjustment experiences. Therefore, I have my presentation being divided into two sections. The first part, briefly concentrating on the human settlement planning aspects. And uh, the second part, particularly as part, as part of the theme of this particular workshop. I have been told that I have only 20 minutes to share this. And uh, again, within this given time, I'll as much as possible uh, share my experiences. Well, uh, Bhutan is blessed with uh, a very rich and natural built rich and natural built environment, and we contribute largely this to our exemplary ethics on conservation and preservation. While we have a very rich and rich natural and built environment, Bhutan also experiences rapid socio-economic development, which in fact, if it is not being managed, is going to have adverse impact on our environment. Unlike India, Bhutan's land resources are very scarce. There is a competing demand, especially the priorities given by the government at the national level. For example, food self-sufficiency is a national development goal we collectively pursue. At the same time, environment conservation is mandated in the, in the constitution. However, there is a requirement for service land in human settlement areas. Therefore, there is a very competing demand for land, especially service. Like any other country, especially in our region, we also experience challenges such as rural urban migration, increased pressure on resources, climate change industries, housing shortages, and so on. For our Bhutanese, the form and the typology of settlement that we have is quite picturesque. And our Bhutanese can always identify themselves to a settlement whereby the form, the typology, it's quite significant in the sense that uh, the most uh, undesirable or most unproductive land is being used for development. And the most productive land is always conserved for cultivation, primarily because we are a landlocked country and we are dependent so much on agriculture and its produce. The form and the character, it eventually manifests in most of our settlements, the spiritual or the monastery as the highest taking point, surrounded by the, the, the village settlements and the farmlands. However, with the trend of the so-called modern socioeconomic development, the impact has been quite evident, especially the adverse impact of the social socioeconomic development. In the event that uh, the settlements are not being managed. This is how we could perceive Bhutan in 10 years time and a very undesirable output that we collectively as a nation see. To give an example, this is an image of our capital city sometime in 1990s. This is what we have in 2009. So within two decades, the facets of the so-called socioeconomic development has taken many folds, encroaching 
into the precious agricultural land which we as a Bhutanese identify ourselves. The development on the slopes are one of the emerging trends and the challenges that we face. In the event that we are not being mindful as a Bhutanese, this could be a result of the so-called uh, development on the slopes in some of our neighboring states of the, the, the neighboring states in India. Therefore, it is very important for a Bhutanese to identify ourselves, particularly to seek a paradigm, a, a planning paradigm which is more suit, which is the most suitable for Bhutanese. We associate ourselves this paradigm as a cultural landscape. The cultural landscape is going to be a planning paradigm, paradigm for our Bhutanese. So when I say cultural landscape, it constitutes of three broad parameters. Firstly, the spiritual landscape, the second, the agricultural landscape, and thirdly, the social landscape. In the event that we are able to be sensitive enough to incorporate this in our human settlement planning and development, we are quite hopeful. And in fact, we are confident that the state of environment that we have in Bhutan could be preserved and protected to a large extent. Therefore, cultural landscape is an identity for Bhutan. In fact, uh, Bhutan is also familiar to many of the planning movements and concepts, starting from the Garden City, City Beautiful, to the recent ones such as the Smart Growth, Green Urbanism, and Smart Cities. However, the most appropriate for a Bhutanese context, in line with our GNH, the Gross National Happiness Development Philosophy, is to bring in a mix of the four important parameters, the socioeconomic development, the preservation of culture, conservation of environment, and the good governance structure in human settlement planning and development in Bhutan. Therefore, based on this principle, based on this foundation, some of the principles that we believe are to earmark clear delineation between settlement and non-settlement areas, preserve historic and cultural sites and structures, also to ensure that there are no settlements to be located in disaster-prone areas, and at the same time, accord at most importance to the conservation of our agriculture land. In doing so, we must also provide opportunities for different economies, employment, and livelihood in order to promote cluster of settlements that eventually promotes cultural landscape. The institutional and the legal framework are in place right at the national, the regional, and particularly at the local level, which are quite pertinent and uh, relevant in terms of human settlement planning and uh, development. The legal framework are also in place starting with a policy, the so-called National Human Settlement Policy, which is an overarching policy for the entire nation, supported and implemented through strategies and legislation, act, uh, sorry, uh, guidelines, and, and so on. What is quite relevant to today's workshop is the land mobilization mechanisms that we deploy at the time of planning. So these are the four, these are the three mechanisms or the tools that we use to mobilize land. Land acquisition, land pooling and land readjustment. And in, on some instances, we use a model which is a combination of both. To go particularly to now to the second section of my presentation, on the land pooling and land readjustment. I would like to begin by saying that uh, for a long time, in fact, uh, urbanization in Bhutan is quite uh, new, only started sometimes in 1990s. We have had an experience of over two, two decades. However, in the past, land acquisition, like in other countries, has been quite common, which was found to be very ineffective, but in, in particular, this tool has been inequitable, and it has, in fact, uh, increased the gap between the rich and the poor. Therefore, in 1999, a scheme 
eventually borrowed from uh, our neighbor co neighboring countries, including that of India, Japan, and Germany as well. So adopted the scheme in the, in the, in the urban planning and development. There were few towns, cities, which were built on, those, on this particular model prior to having any legislations in place. Now, with some form of legislation in place, commanded, in fact, mandated through some of our acts, including that of Local Government Act and the Land Act of Bhutan 2007, land pooling and land readjustment has been legally being allowed to use as a, to be employed, to be deployed as a planning scheme or a planning tool at the time of planning. To take you through some of the, some of the processes that we do during land pooling and land readjustment, the, the primary one is to establish the principles of land pooling and land readjustment. As indicated here, it is of prime importance particularly to facilitate reconfiguration of plots for appropriate development. That should be one of the first principles to take this particular scheme as part of, land, as part of planning. The second principle is to facilitate and provide for infrastructure within a settlement. So when I say settlement, it includes both urban and rural areas. The third and the most important uh, principle is to also ensure that uh, we have contribution by the landowners during the construction or during, at the time of deploying the infrastructure. However, this principle is yet to gain a lot of popularity. Through establishing these principles, in fact, uh, we have throughout the nation, in fact, uh, deployed land pooling and land readjustment scheme. And uh, if I may relate some of the examples to the preparation of the so-called structure plans and the local area plans to implement our town planning schemes. Briefly, again, to highlight on the processes, the process of land pooling itself, I suppose everyone here is familiar with. Like everyone, we carry out feasibility study which will be elaborated in my next slide. The most important for this particular scheme to gain the support of the public, not only the landowners, but the residents of that particular community. In doing so, it is incumbent of the local government and the central agencies for planning and development to issue or to declare a land pooling and a land readjustment scheme through a public notice. Less, not less than 21 days will be given for this particular notice in order to ensure that there is enough sensitization and dissemination of this particular scheme. At the time of requiring or gaining public support, it is important that a copy of feasibility study is being shared with all the landowners and the residents to gain their confidence. So within these 21 days, it is important for the residents and the landowners of that particular community to either support or reject this particular planning tool or planning scheme. So it has to be either in a written form or through a verbal recording, which is, being, which is to be reported to the local government or the central agency responsible for planning in that particular area. So in the event of a public support, it is important now to declare that particular area as in land, to be using land pooling scheme as a planning tool. So in doing so, the most important criteria that we undertake is to secure two third majority vote. So if there is a consent of two third through by our regulations and by our legislations, it is legally allowed to deploy this particular scheme. So in doing so, the local government now can declare this particular area as land pooling scheme area. 
And having done, it is important for the local government to also notify the central agency or the ministry responsible for human settlement development. After the declaration, it is also required that it is being, it is being notified in all forms of media, including that of print. In the event there is less than, in the event that there is no consent or the remaining one third does not agree with the particular land pooling scheme, then starts the negotiation and the acquisition process. So as of date, in fact, uh, I would like to inform that uh, the newer urban development schemes or human settlement plans have deployed land pooling and land readjustment as a tool, and there was no single instance of requiring the local government or the ministry to acquire. However, there is a process which is being established to proceed with negotiation and acquisition for the remaining one third who has not agreed to that particular scheme. Once the area has been declared, the most important part of the process is to declare a moratorium both on construction and transaction of land and properties within that particular area to facilitate planning processes. Let me briefly take you through the feasibility study that I've indicated above. So when I say feasibility study, like in maybe in your case in India, the feasibility study process could be same. In fact, uh, the land pooling feasibility study can be initiated by the local government, by the central government, or a group of landowners themselves can come together and initiate, can initiate a feasibility study on this particular scheme. So once the process has been initiated, all technical requirements, including that of uh, land holding, land parcels, survey, and so on has to be completed as part of the due process. In fact, during this process of a feasibility study, the legislation requires public hearing amongst themselves in order to ensure that we gain support of the residents. While this could be quite common, what we as a Bhutanese emphasize so much is on the, prim uh, the, the preliminary cost estimate and the preliminary financing plan right from the beginning before even declaring the particular scheme as a, as, as a planning tool. Why pre preliminary cost estimate? Because we have instances where the, the, the land pooling and the land readjustment scheme do not get implemented. Therefore, it is important from the beginning to identify the resources for the implementation of the plan. In doing so, like it may be in, in many cases in India and in Nepal, the idea of the so-called reserve plots, which are pooled from the landowners to be used as part of resources during the building or during the implementation of the infrastructure. It is also important to have a preliminary financing plan based on the broad area calculation and the, the, the quick method that we deploy to calculate this too. As soon as the area has been declared for uh, that particular scheme, through the process, it is now to Im important to finalize the land pooling scheme, land pooling and the land readjustment scheme through formation of consultative committees. The legislations require a committee to be constituted after, de after the declaration of the land pooling scheme to ensure that there is a transparent and an accountable process during the process of planning. But more importantly, this consultative committee acts or behaves more as a bridge 
between the landowners and the residents and a team, a technical team responsible for the preparation of plan. So it is more important for people and the residents that their aspirations and the dreams are being captured in the plan through this particular committee. Often at time, it is very difficult for a technical planner to have one-to-one -one consultation with the landowners on all occasion. Though by the legislation, as I said earlier, it is required to carry out a minimum requirement numbers of public hearing with the residents and the landowners. Therefore, this consultative committee, which can be a member as per the legislation, I mean, not more than three appointed by the local government. Three, not more than three or four from the technical planning team and a maximum of five representing the landowners and, uh, and the residents. In doing so, they will be in a position to deliberate on many issues, including that of contribution ratios, their location, the location and number of reserve plots, the infrastructure needs, standards, and so on. In case of Bhutan, it is also important to indicate or to give an indicative contribution ratio prior to the initiation of the plan preparation in order to equip the residents and the landowners of their responsibility of contribution. The legislation allow maximum of 30% land pooling contribution for the provision of infrastructure and utilities and services. However, there are also ex exceptions whereby if the pooling, con pooling or the ratio, the contribution ratio exceeds 30%, it requires consent of again, not less than two third of the remaining, of, of the two third of the, of the landowners and the residents within that particular community. The preliminary infrastructure budget, as it has been apportioned as part of the scheme, can help in determining the size, the location of the reserve plots through the land pooling scheme, which are later to be auctioned at a market rate. So therefore, people are made aware of the reserve plots right from the beginning of the land pooling scheme. The other aspects during the land pooling process is the reconfiguration of plots. And there are many principles which are being followed during the reconfiguration process. The first and the very important principle that we pursue is the principle of correspondence as I heard from some of our speakers below, to ensure that people, the landowners, are displaced minimal, minimally from their original location. It is also important through the land pooling scheme to ensure that if there are a larger chunk of plots, there should be, subdiv there should be subdivision in the process, in the in the event that the landowner intends to subdivide. The minimum land holding or the minimum plot size are being prescribed in the development cultural regulations or even in the legislations passed by the parliament beyond or below which a person cannot subdivide. It is, it is also important to consider access, not only road access given our terrain and our topography, it is Many a times, even if we deploy the land pooling and land readjustment scheme, we are not able to provide road access. Therefore, even in the form of common footpath or a common parking system, those principles are to be considered right from the beginning. So as part of the feasibility study, as I indicated below, above, there could be instances where some of these structures could be impacted through the land pooling scheme in the interest of the wider community. However, at most care has to be given to avoid demolition of permanent structures. 
The land pooling ratio, as I said, is not to exceed 30% by legislation, but it can, on given some instances, particularly the exceptions are as indicated below. The most important part of this particular scheme is to carry out exhaustive consultative processes meeting stakeholder consultation with the landowners. Though the legislation prescribes only two public consultation meetings in the draft land pooling scheme, however, we have the practice of carrying out not less than five consultative meetings for all our planning, for all our plan preparation processes. So once the local, once the land pooling scheme and the area is being approved, the local, gov the local government takes the full authority and they approve the scheme as per the provisions of the legislation. The government on many instances implement the land pooling scheme after making the final land pooling plan with the contribution ratio clearly indicated and notifying the ministry and the minister responsible for human settlement and human settlement planning and development. While uh, since we have an experience of little over two decades, we have many issues. And uh, if I may highlight some of the issues here, the first and the foremost is delay in the implementation of the land pooling schemes, particularly in view of not having adequate resources to do so. More so, the legislation does not permit to go beyond certain contribution ratio, that the limit was 30%. So this in fact uh, makes, or this in fact makes our scenario worse in the sense that uh, we are not able to seek, or in fact, uh, deploy the resources contributed by the private landowners to implement the plan. There were instances of uh, not having clear cost estimates of the project as indicated in the plan, which eventually led to not implementing some of the land pooling schemes effectively. As as echoed by some of, our, uh, some of our past speakers, we also have issues of land titles, not having record, but not to the extent of the, the Indian states that you have it in, in India. So however, we hope that, uh, if, since I've been asked to wrap up, we hope that uh, the land pooling scheme as the theme for sustainable development will only help Bhutan as we continue to pursue continued peace, prosperity, and happiness. Thank you once again for having the patience to listen to me. While I may not have the answers to many of your questions, I will humbly try to address some of the issues, if any, during the question and answer sessions. Karin Che, Tashi Dele, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tashi Penjor, for this very interesting and comprehensive presentation of the way that the land pooling system has developed in Bhutan. And indeed, Bhutan is well known in the region as having made some very interesting and uh, far far sighted uh, you know, governance uh, innovations uh, in this region. I would now like to call upon uh, Dr. Sudha Shreshta, who is uh, currently working as the head of the Department of Architecture in the Institute of Engineering, Tribhuvan University, Nepal. She has worked as the coordinator of MSc in Urban Planning Program in the department. She practices in planning and architecture and has done several land pooling projects. She has also prepared periodic plan for several municipalities and district development committees. In addition, she has experience of comprehensive integrated urban development plan preparation. I kindly invite ma'am to proceed. Thank you. Good morning. 
respected moderator uh, Pradeep Tugos, uh, respected panelists and participants. Actually, I am very pleased to be here to share our knowledge. Uh, I was thinking, I was thinking that I will share a few things, but instead of that, I got such an insight from this workshop that uh, yesterday and this morning uh, I could grasp most of knowledge from here. Actually, after a presentation of uh, Saruma ji and also Tashi ji, I don't need to do any presentations <laughs> because all of my presentations made by themselves. And I will, anyway, I will share my experience here. May, uh, and also those experience also already uh, given by uh, those both of them. So thank you very much for Tashi ji and Sarma ji, which I was thinking is already came here, but still I will repeat few experience from my side. Uh, actually, I'm working in the Institute of Engineering and doing research. Uh, I'm also the director of one center, research center that is called Center for Urban Planning Studies, uh, which I have given, I have forgotten to give uh, Ankrita ji. Uh, in that organization, that is also under Trivon University and Institute of Engineering, IOE. Uh, IOE is the pre prestigious in, uh, institute in Nepal. Uh, and uh, I did research on land pooling. These uh, challenges and uh, issues of land pooling in Nepal. And this uh, research, we jointly did research with uh, Mr. Asim Ratnabajaracharya, who is also present here. Actually, I will go straight to the Nepal because I, I think I don't need to give any introduction of Nepal here in India especially because we are very close, close to everything like geographically and culturally, we are similar. So I thought that I don't need to give any introduction like Bhutan here. Land pulling concept was first adopted in Nepal to build a road in Pokhara. Pokhara is a very beautiful city, touristic city, where you'll get very beautiful uh, sceneries, uh, different natural resources, etc. And they have uh, um, started this uh, approach to widen the road. And at the same time, uh, with widening the road, they also develop the area using this pull land pulling uh, tool. And it was very successful. So this experience, uh, land pulling uh, was uh, replicated in many other cities of Nepal. Uh, actually, uh, in Nepal, unlike India, India is a large country and it has abundant source of land. In Nepal, no, we, have, we are a very small country. Even land is scarce and most of the land also very steep, very steep hills uh, for uh, development of uh, country and development of these uh, settlements is very, very difficult. So um, land in many cities, price is very uh, high. Because of that also, it is very successful in Nepal. Land pooling project is the best practice in Nepal. As uh, maybe you, you may know that uh, we have very successful stories of land pooling. And uh, uh, this land pooling, like here, yesterday we heard that we have very good land uh, Ad Ad acquisition act 2013. Uh, we heard that very good compensations and land owners are very privileged, but uh, we do not have such type of things. Uh, in uh, 1988, there is some provision was given in Town Development Act. Yes, there is a need of shelter. Uh, there are many people who are without shelters, but uh, nonetheless, uh, 
we we um, in our rural areas and even in um, urban areas <clears throat> very less people are homeless but still in urban areas because of uh, this migration and uh, pooling factors in Kathmandu like Kathmandu capital city and other larger cities there is very <clears throat> shortage of houses shortage of housing and uh, at the same time yes we are lacking of uh, housing but our government also um, not very rich or economic booming like uh, andhra pradesh yesterday we have uh, heard about amravati how beautifully they have made uh, their compensation things that people like to give <laughs> their uh, uh, plots of land instead of selling by themselves that is very good aspect for um, these land owners but we do not have such type of things and another thing is the land holding size like size are very um, irregular it means somebody has very large size somebody has very less land and uh, size is also irregular like um, what tashi ji has already mentioned in their uh, that in his uh, um, slide that uh, very illegal things and to develop something is very very difficult so we we use land pooling with land readjustment we pull land and we plan regular uh, and and then we uh, dispose land to the people actually actually here uh, sentence is not very correctly written virtually land pulling is the only one uh, tool that we can develop our country uh, for housing for different, different other development aspects and uh, as i said that in previous days government has acquired land by acquisition method and that was acquisition act was formulated in 1963 uh, and another is we have property like property right in our constitutions and there is one other the point that if government has to develop some buildings or development uh, for welfare of people government can acquire land so <clears throat> in the past when they acquire they could acquire because people are unaware they are <laughs> illiterate they could manage to acquire but later on Uh, in 70s and 80s people were not very you know Ill illiterate they aware of these things and uh, the government could not acquire land through acquisition and uh, and this uh, to plan the cities definitely uh, we have to uh, you know like i um, have to have land is the basic need basic thing for uh, planning the cities and also the development activities and also definitely for housing we have to have regular and uh, appropriate plots for development so um, here we applied land pooling things and which is uh, the success story Uh, we also have success story because it is win win project like for compensation uh, like in bhutan and in gujarat uh, we do not have to pay anything for uh, land owners because uh, after development of land when we return the land price will be uh, rise in such a way that people are very happy with that and also government has uh, saleable plots commercial plots government sell these plots and uh, refund the development uh, cost and i i i am basically focus on kathmandu valley Kathm kathmandu valley is very land scarce and we uh, had very happy that growth because uh, we have you know trend of if you have land definitely kathmandu valley itself is very, very fertile land so it's very very good production there but still 
because of housing need, people can construct their houses without wood, without any sorts of infrastructures, without uh, electricity, without water. Th that was there in the beginning. So it was very costly to construct road for one person or few houses. And because of that, we have started land pooling for planning purposes. Few areas we have now completed land pooling, and I, I'd like to show Kathmandu, uh, which is capital city. Lalitpur is close to this uh, Kathmandu and Bhaktapur. These three uh, uh, cities are very renowned. Actually, in the beginning, in uh, ancient period, this uh, Kathmandu, Bhaktapur, and Lalitpur are very famous for good planning. They had uh, very uh, nicely planned uh, that uh, occupation of the people and the country is agriculture. So they have um, selected these very fertile land for agriculture. They conserve, they, they preserve those land and uh, not very fertile lands were used for settlement. And the settlement was compact, not very large plot. So in this way it was uh, planned in the past. But in mid, in between, uh, before 1950s, even 60s, people used to start housing, uh, construct, construct houses uh, in their property, uh, Happy Jardly. So town was developed uh, like Happy Jard. There is no proper road, no drainage, no electricity, and one scooter or motorcycle bike only go to their access to their houses in such type of Hapajar was there to uh, overcome these problems, definitely we are making. But that is also very beat and piece, very small uh, areas, not like here in India. And we have studied uh, uh, these uh, projects which were in Kathmandu Valley. And area was, you can see, like very, very small areas Dallu, Naya Bazar, Gongabu, Chaba Hill, these are, some are 20, some are even 46 hectares, some seven hectares, uh, one hectare is 2.5 acre. Here it, it is very large in size and also controlling and uh, getting success. Here we have very small, small size. And land use in LP projects like uh, for road, we have 20%. Here it is 21% in uh, average. And open space, uh, we have uh, by bylaws 5%. Here 4.8%. And developable area 66%. Like very small plots for uh, open space. Uh, actually, these are all uh, those which I have showed uh, previous slides that was completed projects, and these are uh, ongoing projects in Kathmandu Valley. And uh, government has uh, uh, formulated and tried and planning of new towns in different uh, different places in Nepal, uh, and in those uh, towns also, these housing were developed through land pooling projects. And I, I am also involved in few uh, places in this land pooling projects. Land pooling projects are going on in very small areas, but still the challenges and issues are uh, uh, immense, very, very much. And what are these uh, problems and issues we already di discussed here? <laughs> still, I am again repeating these things. Uh, as I said, this uh, land size is, uh, area itself is very small because we are scarce of land. And another thing is uh, these, these uh, replotting and redistribution was one of the major uh, protests because they don't know uh, when we call applications for um, consent, uh, people are scared of that. They are not aware about 
the land pulling benefits of this in the past. And that's why misconception, they, they are scared of, you know, giving consent. And also when you give consent, uh, our government has to collect the land certificate, which is called in local name Lal Purza. So we have to give them uh, and register them. And that time, people are a little bit hesitant to provide these Lal Purza. It means uh, land certificate to the government. And another problem, big problem is those who are, uh, you know, owning very large plots. Because uh, most of the previous uh, experience, they, are, they made very small, small plots. Our land uh, limitation is like uh, two ana, two paisa. Two ana means very small plots compared to um, acre. And that is like, just a minute, I'd like to show that. Mm. is one ropni, okay? One hectare is 2.5 acre. One ropni is one by eight. It means 0 0.125. It means 0 0.13. And one ropni is equal to 16 anas, okay? And and uh, these are, and we have uh, bylaws that we have to uh, maintain at least two ana, two paisa, even small, very small plot for housing. And people are, uh, you know, people are having very large plots, um, are uh, making protest, you know. They don't like to give, um, because even in Nepal, there are very much problem on these land brokers. They get very much profit on that. They construct by themselves only road and drainage, and then uh, collecting very large amount of money. So those brokers also, who have uh, their own, not own, they have collected land, uh, they are always protests of this type of um, program. And another what we found is boundary delineation. Like yesterday we talked mapping, not correctly mapping, and also the uh, boundary, which boundary is whose. They are uh, doing their agriculture things, but, but they, they delineate by themselves, and the map and the uh, in the field ground field is not very correct, so that is also very much problem for us to do these things, uh, this planning work. And another is is like uh, and another in our context, what what was the problem is, okay, land was developed, but people could not manage to construct houses, and land was vacant itself, land were. And those vacant land, if there is many, then again speculations things happen. And what, what was the government objective to fulfill the housing problem is not fulfilled, is not solved. And another, in the past, of course, nowadays, feasibility study is a must for beginning the land pooling projects. But uh, in the beginning, even land pooling projects were land pooling uh, uh, tools is used without feasibility study. And these uh, land pooling projects are also not very successful. And another thing, our government has uh, formulated that there should be, in every urban area, there should be one town development committee. Town development committee was formed by Ministry of Urban Development in urban areas. And this town development committee is looked after because uh, they, they are, their role is to uh, manage these land pooling uh, areas, this planning uh, as well. But somehow, somewhere, these uh, town development committees are not very far for uh, land pooling process. And because of the, these people also, uh, uh, you know, mm, uh, project is not successful because uh, definitely because of that they don't know the importance of uh, planning. They don't know the benefit of land pooling. So because of that also sometimes it happens. Uh, I was involved with, in this Pokhuria land pooling project which is in uh, Birgans, which is very close to Roxol. So I was uh, involved on that because I am the team leader of that local uh, land pooling. 
And what happened was it was pending since 30 years back. It was, and that time they have already collected land certificate. And people were waiting and waiting. Our government is not very uh, stable that time. We had conflict, as you know, that Maoist uh, terrorist uh, the, those days. And uh, government is also not stable. One uh, person will come and change another after a few months. And such type of things will happen. And it long uh, prolonged till uh, 30 years. And when I got that uh, project, uh, I went, I uh, gave them aware, make them aware, made them, and give even training. Uh, and they were OK, happy. Everything was OK. We did this project. Even we put peg, because uh, in our country, like uh, in the past, they used to, government used to do by themselves, their uh, staff members. But uh, after that, even from 80s and 90s, they have uh, given to the consultancies to work. So I could get that opportunity. I got opportunity to work on it. And uh, we did very good. Everyone was, everybody was happy. Every things happened. And even we made that boundaries things. Even we, according to our uh, design, of course. But uh, what happened was we submitted our reports, everything, and then government, the person who is dealing with this project uh, was not very dynamic. Uh, he took a long time to submit to the cabinet because these, after completion of these things, we have to submit the cabinet and cabinet has to give permission to implement. So it took a long time. And then what happened, the TDC members, they have, um, they, they completed their tenure and another group of TDC came and then what happened? And then protest. Again, this work was not been done. So such type of things will happen uh, in our co country. Oh, yes, contribution ratio is, if contribution ratio is high, then definitely people will protest. Uh, uh, there will be conflict. And also another th problem, definitely in this uh, uh, case, uh, we had lots of uh, different discussions, negotiations uh, uh, will be made and then come to one uh, negotiated point. And another thing, as I said, brokers definitely they are very, uh, you know, protests of land and pulling uh, projects. And another thing is violation of bylaws. Okay, implemented, everything was done, but how we design the form of that particular area because of violations of this uh, rule, so it will not get as, uh, as we thought. Like uh, we have given only up to three stories. They made uh, five stories. They extend uh, stories and things. That's why we should have uh, bylaws, not for all whole city, we have to have bylaws, particularly in those areas according to context. What type of context is there? Which type of things we have to look after and we have to make a bylaws so that uh, that will be fulfilled. And another is definitely minimum plot size. Again, again, uh, before that question came, my question was raised. Those who have very minimum size, like uh, contribution is 30%, but after 30%, uh, if there is no such, uh, remaining two, uh, two ana, two paisa, for uh, construction, then there will be a problem. And there should be a separate negotiation, like uh, Sarmaji said, that uh, in Gujarat, they have to, we have to separate negotiate with them. Uh, sometimes we mm, reduce the, uh, these percentages. And sometimes what happened was, uh, if they have, uh, they need few annas, then they have to buy from the government again from that commercial plot. They have to buy, but for them, definitely subsidized rate, with subsidized rate, which rate uh, government, has, uh, government is selling other commercial plots, uh, they will subsidize for them to buy because uh, nobody likes to displace them. And if uh, plot is very small, uh, all um, land will go, then definitely in similar manner, uh, they will give to another place 
but definitely in subsidized rate. Or sometimes um, they have to move out, but government will uh, compensate in another place. Or definitely they have to buy for that, but in a subsidized rate. Yes, that is also improper placement. Like people like to get their plot in front of la big wide street and such type of like open spaces. And in this case, also very problem. Because those people who have their land before land pulling, they like to get the same, same, same place, same location. And uh, we also try to give them, uh, we tried as much as possible to give, locate them in that uh, places. But sometimes, definitely, we cannot give the, this place, and we have to negotiate with them. But we haven't given any compensation, any subsidies for them, because before uh, implementing, before planning that our, our local area, uh, this planning through land pooling, uh, they do not have any facilities, even no streets, no road, no water, no electricity, no infrastructure. So we, we convince them we have to, and people are convincing in that matter. And another is uh, like uh, those people who want to move, maybe they don't like, such type of category is also there. Okay, I will sell my plot and go. And in that case also, uh, government is getting land, buying land from them. Uh, and uh, make displacement for them. They will shift their place. And the time, definitely time is very crucial. And uh, we had, uh, what we did research, and they have completed from three years to uh, 13 years. Some land pooling areas completed in 13 years, some even in three years. So uh, which one is more than uh, even like eight, nine, 10, 13, 11 years, they are definitely, very delayed, but here we do not need to give any compensation because of delay. That's why people are waiting. And another thing is those uh, whose certificate is collected to the government, by, by the government, um, they can sell their plots. They can sell their plots, but they are not allowed to fragment the plots. Most of the people, if they have uh, two ropanis, they like to cut their plot, in one ropani, one ropani keep for themselves, one ropani they like to sell. In that case, the government will not allow. But the ownership, if transfer, then it's allowed. That's why 11 years also they are waiting. <laughs> they will wait. And definitely the price is gone up in that way. Issues of uh, some uh, vacant land, because uh, these lands are for housing purpose. We, we have applied land pulling only for uh, these roads and things and also for uh, housing. So we haven't uh, implemented it in other, uh, sorry, sorry, in other uh, aspect. So these are my, and open space, allocation of open space. Uh, when they allocate and plan their uh, urban area, they, you know, try to bring more commercial plots. Instead of giving open spaces, facilities to the people, no. Uh, wherever there is, um, you know, not very preferable place, there they give open space. And how we deal with this, definitely uh, uh, this land freeze is problem. Definitely we have to work on it. And, and negotiation, definitely we negotiate. Most of the time, contribution rate is high, so uh, people protest and we talk with them and we reduce, of course, government side reduce the compensation, uh, you know, the contribution ratio. Like in Nijgarh land pooling area, uh, first of all, we have, uh, we, we said 40%, but uh, at the end, we came up to 30%. And you know, it is very beneficial. It was before land pooling, uh, one anna, five lakhs only. And when we started that land pooling, it, the anna cost 35 lakhs. In that way, people are very ha happy that the contribution is also okay. 
and sometimes people raise that government has to give infrastructure and things why should we need to pay for that and then in case actually in our country what is happening is in local areas like uh, government ha uh, local uh, local government municipalities they contribute uh, 60% and the user committee has to contribute 40% it is all all, all over the uh, nepal and uh, taking that example the areas uh, these uh, people from these landowners from land pooling area also raise this issue if they don't need to contribute anything and getting 60% from government why should we need to why should we need to give that's why most of the time they um, uh, requested on that way and uh, that also was given like municipality they form user committee of uh, land pooling area and then um, 60% uh, contribute by municipalities like in all other places so contribution rate will be again uh, low less and another is definitely awareness and training program awareness and training program is very very necessary for uh, those who are involved from government side those who are involved as a consultant and those who are uh, land owners if, if we have to give training and awareness program to everyone in our country those who are involved in government side uh, facilitate those program they went to take uh, training to japan also in korea south korea where there, these land pooling projects were very successful so government people go to japan or korea to get this knowledge and we had many uh, such engineers and architects who had this type of knowledge to uh, implement the projects of course what we need is actually our traditional uh, planning system is mixed land use and pedestrian pedestrianized definitely if we can uh, design properly with pedestrianized friendly and uh, mixed use uh, mixed use Uh, then it will be very very useful because we can bring uh, more uh, commercial plots we can contribute more in open spaces and in such way we can do like uh, in roads wide road uh, we may, we can minimize the land for these things and adequate open space is very very important for us because this uh, large earthquake 2015 gorkha earthquake gave uh, you know knowledge to us that if these open spaces are there then we can accommodate these uh, shelters for you know rescue people and things and if we you know design in such a way that if open space is there then definitely these uh, open spaces can be used in different purposes and also the environment and ecology will be maintained uh, to minimize back in land definitely we need to provide fa facilities in lp areas in one uh, land pooling area in liwali what happened was uh, land pooling was completed but nobody came to construct their houses there nobody and the municipality decided to construct such type of facilities so that people can attract there and uh, they have constructed engineering institute that khopo engineering college first there it is education infrastructure so and then slowly people came and full uh, fulfill this uh, vacant land use this vacant land and another one thing is definitely if something happened like that uh, conflict also made us fulfill this uh, in all uh, land pooling areas because because of conflict people could not manage to live in rural areas these uh, maoist were there they could not could not they didn't give peace to live in so people were um, concentrated in uh, urban areas and those people also came and uh, bought their uh, these vacant lands because of that also most of the vacant lands nowadays is <laughs> um, used okay i have talked everything okay where is my
Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much for listening my presentation. <laughs> thank you so much. And I, I'd like to get opportunity to thank our thank Terry first of all. Terry, because uh, Terry invited me to present here and share knowledge. I was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I am very happy to get knowledge from here, even in larger, very larger size, larger towns. So thank you very much, and especially uh, Dr. Mathur, Dr. Preeti, and all of you, and Ankita. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shreshta, and of course, listening to your presentation and the issues and uh, difficulties that you faced, uh, one is one was always struck by, uh, you know, by the fact that your experience is actually very parallel to the kind of experience that we have in India. So, well, we are all part of the South Asian culture, so I think, you know, it cannot be otherwise. So, please. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I would now like to invite Ms. Parul Agarwal. Uh, Ms. Parul Agarwal is an urban development practitioner with experience working on strategic policy analysis, land use and spatial planning, economic development and zo zoning legislation. She has worked in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Palestine, Sri Lanka and the United States. Ms. Agarwal is currently working with the UN Habitat as program manager and regional urban expert for South Asia region. In this role, she is promoting the new urban agenda and sustainable development goals into the national policy frameworks on urban development, housing, and informal settlements. I kindly invite ma'am to proceed. Yeah, greetings everybody um, to uh, Dr. Ghosh, the panelists and the uh, delegates are present here. Um, I'll keep my presentation short. I uh, wanted to uh, present to you and focus more on the social aspects of land pooling and land readjustments. Uh, so in my presentation, I'll cover this tool, uh, the participatory and inclusive land readjustment, the pillar tool uh, that UN Habitat has used and applied in um, in most in in Latin America, um, in uh, in Bogota and Medellin. Um, so so we all uh, realize how the how our cities are growing. Here's an illustration of the city of Me uh, Medellin, Colombia, where from 1928, where it was. Uh, a city of merely 120,000, it, it grew to uh, to a, a metropolitan city. Uh, but with that, also, you can see from the illustration the expansion of the urban footprint. A lot of it has uh, occurred in an unplanned manner. It was organic development, which has consequences on, um, on, on uh, future uh, sustainable growth. Uh, some some trends um, uh, to this end. The population growth uh, we see in the less developed country um, countries has uh, mostly doubled. But in terms of their urban sprawl, the urban extents have increased by a factor of 3.5 uh, compared to the developed countries where the population is growing at a slower rate at uh, with a factor of 1.2. Uh, and the urban extents are also, um, you know, are, are at a lesser rate, which means that the cities are probably uh, densifying more. Um, this is an example perhaps that you uh, have known. So this is um, an illustration on how land readjustment and land tooling can, uh, land pooling uh, can, uh, can benefit the urban form and also lead to sustainable development um, that, that is uh, more, uh, um, you know, that, that bears more consideration to the use of resources and, and growth. Um, this, I know this slide is something Mr. Penger also, he had on his, uh, in his presentation. Um, and uh, perhaps I don't need to go into uh, too much detail, but it's, it's showing again how land readjustment through replotting can not only improve uh, certain basic characteristics, improving the access uh, to of each, um, of each landowner to the public uh, goods, um, but also uh, how this tool can be used through the use of uh, reserve lands to, to kind of build a more sustainable financing model. 
So what is uh, land readjustment? It involves, uh, so the, there are some finer distinctions um, between uh, this, uh, this tool. Um, so the land readjustment involves pooling land parcels in a particular area and planning them as one unit, uh, putting in roads, sewerage, and other infrastructure, and then dividing land back to the original owners. So each owner gets a, it gets a plot, which mostly is a smaller area, uh, but, the, but the land values um, increased and there are other benefits. So uh, it's important because it facilitates um, access to public spaces, uh, buildable plots and public uh, use. Um, however, uh, because of lack of suitable instruments, the supply of urban lands um, at scale is, is less, uh, which leads to a uh, proliferation of slums, constraints in uh, city extension, uh, both vertically and horizontally. In the case of Medla, it, despite the, the geography, there was a lot of development that went um, on, onto the foothills and uh, on the hillsides. Um, and, um, and this tool is important where, in the context where expropriation or, or land um, um, uh, you know, just uh, using eminent domain for uh, for acquiring land is not attractive. Um, the uses of land, the urban, uh, the land readjustment tool has been used for uh, uh, to prevent urban expansion, um, but it can also be useful in in making this rural to urban uh, conversion more um, more uh, uh, more practical. Uh, the tool can also be used for densification in fill and uh, urban renewal, particularly to convert low density areas into high density, rejuvenation of, uh, of downtowns, and for rebuilding after disasters. Uh, slum upgrading is another area where this uh, tool can be used. Um, so I'll probably just skip this slide. Uh, the, this is showing on what are the drawbacks of uh, land expropriation. Uh, some some examples, uh, some uh, you know case studies where this tool has worked internationally in Bogota, where as you can see on the slide before the uh, before the intervention, uh, the ratio of built up area to open space was uh, was very uh, low. However, using the tool, um, the access to uh, uh, to the public uh, spaces increased a, fa a fair amount. Um, and and that's that's I think the the benefit of uh, of using more inclusive uh, places. Uh, Medela is another case, um, you know, another city where this tool has been used. So you can see the the contrast in developed uh, in planned areas and the informal um, uh, character of the areas that were before uh, the scheme was applied. Um, so. In the following slides, I just want to uh, cover quickly some lessons learned from these international uh, examples. Uh, conventionally, the land readjustment projects focus more on the reshaping functions. Uh, the focus is on dialogue between just the legally interested parties of where the, the ownership who owns the land kind of comes into play. Um, and it's based on the idea that everybody wins. Um, it recognizes the formal property rights and the public interest in the form of collective interests. Uh, but this participatory and inclusive land readjustment is um, is, uh, is 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 a is a little broader, um, you know, has a broader mandate. Uh, it's a mechanism through which different owners and anybody who has claims to the land is is part of the process, uh, where uh, it's combined into uh, the whole area is combined into one large area, and and then uh, the reparceling and development of the uh, property is done. Uh, the development includes uh, what you know the panelists have also spoken about. Uh, it 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 it, uh, it includes um, improving access to uh, you know uh, access to basic infrastructure, providing service land back to the uh, to the people who are occupying the land in the first place, um, improving access to public spaces and other urban amenities. And it also relies on a negotiated process uh, with both the local authorities and the stakeholders to understand what their interests are and, and to recognize the formal and socially legitimate rights. So this is where um, you know, the, uh, under the new urban agenda, the idea of cities for all is being promoted, where it's not just the rights of the people who own the land, but even people who have been living on that area or anybody that's a part of the city has to be, is, 
is recognized that somebody who has right to access all the um, all the services that you know any urban area has to offer. So this tool has the potential to address serviced land supply issues by looking at the underlying uh, land systems. And again, uh, those have been spoken to uh, by, by our speakers. Um, the benefits of using this tool is that it is more affordable in terms of the process and infrastructure. So even though there is a lot of effort that uh, goes into uh, building that momentum with the communities, at the end, it does pay off. Um, it's, uh, there is a more opportunity to reshape the neighborhoods and cities. It supports the social capital. So it's not about um, uh, just developing the land, but it is also about looking at what were the existing social economic mix of that area and trying to plan it in a more comprehensive way so that those networks are not broken. Um, and it has also opportunity to improve uh, the governance. Um, the aim of this, um, of this approach is to improve the governance by using the optimal use of land. So again, that, that's something that we have spoken to. But here is where it's important that it's also about keeping the process transparent and inclusive for the communities, so that uh, which can then be transferred into the larger urban management and governance frameworks of the, uh, of the uh, local agencies. Um, it also looks at focuses on supporting the livelihoods and job creation by involving the people in the development of that area and by improving the living and working conditions and by increasing the, uh, the access to open spaces. So here is again, um, there are certain rules of thumbs where uh, by looking at um, um, examples globally, 40% um, of, of an area is typically assumed to be um, you know, um, considered to be if 40% of an area of a of a city has is dedicated towards open spaces, which also include roads. That's considered more sustainable. So I think in that in that regard, um, I think um, there are opportunities to use this tool uh, through more inclusive processes to improve access to those spaces where you know we saw um, in the example of Nepal and others where that. Uh, the access, despite the, the land pooling, that uh, access to open space was still quite minimal. Um, it's also important here in terms of uh, looking at the, uh, to look at the power dynamics. Uh, throughout this process, um, there are certain stakeholders that have more uh, hold or more say in the process. So we do see, uh, it's, it's typical, to see banking institutions, donors, municipalities, professionals, landowners, uh, long-time residents, ethnic groups, and su such to have more say in this process of inclusion. However, it is also the responsibility uh, to make the process more inclusive, to look at the interests of those who are borrowing, those who are the marginalized groups, women, minorities, uh, the tenants and squatter settlements. So I think that's the... Uh, those are some of the underlying principles of this pillar process. Um, this is again a, a simple uh, uh, schematic on, on what those uh, steps are. So it begins with conceptualization, uh, but then, uh, and then in parallel, starting the stakeholder engagement right from the very beginning. So to involve the people in, in the concepts at the initial stage. Uh, to gather data with the participation of the community to draft plans, get approval from, from the different stakeholders and, and so on, uh, with the idea that at the uh, core of this, at the heart of this, it's, it's about uh, ensuring the, the people are engaged in the process throughout. Um, the main outcomes that we can see from this approach is that it maintains the social capital. So again, in the interest of what the other speakers have discussed that uh, there's a uh, uh, the underlying principle is to make sure that there's uh, least amount of displacement uh, to improve the local governance. Uh, it also uh, talks about improving the recognition or, or uh, not just looking at the uh, property rights, but also uh, broader definitions of what the property rights are. And here again, um, uh, we are looking at what we are proposing is, is that there is a continuum of property rights that goes from uh, that goes from the occupancy of a land to a full tenure status. 
and and it's important to recognize that uh, that um, it's um, sometimes to just go to a full and uh, formal tenure uh, might uh, add more roadblocks but then that continuum of property rights is something that uh, that sometimes incrementally can lead to more um, a faster implementation of uh, complex projects um, another benefit is that it's advantageous to all the residents of the area not just the landowners it also focuses on including everybody in the neighborhood for in the dialogues um, the main aim is to uh, maintain the uh, interest of the residents after the readjustments which is where the social economic linkages are important to map in the beginning and it's not about just compensating for the for the property rights but it's also the lost interest so we are talking about those social and economic networks that sometimes get broken from uh, during these uh, exercises um, so this is the last slides but this process also comes with its own uh, risks it, it depends upon the extension of vertical development for viability, which is where that um, 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 that that land plot uh, for uh, for future development and finance to make the financing viability comes into play. Um, it requires a put a very good um, momentum amongst the municipality and communities. Uh, Without, which which has high transaction costs, but again, like we were looking at some case studies where um, uh, where uh, political or other um, bureaucratic changes can sometimes push the momentum backwards. Uh, so it's important to uh, to see how that can be neutralized. Um, it requires potential for a good balance between public and private roles, and a careful analysis of also gentrification. So oftentimes under these projects because of the way the property values and other improvements uh, occur, it can lead to gentrification where the original property owners are displaced, nevertheless. So I think that's, I'll end my presentation here. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Parul Agarwal, uh, for this uh, concise but uh, you know, very concise and succinct, but very informative presentation. And I think perhaps you know you could have come earlier in the seminar so that you know the fundamentals of land pooling were made clear to everybody. Uh, and also, thank you for bringing in uh, bring, you know bring on board the international experience with respect to land pooling. So now the floor is open for comments, questions. Again, the rules are you identify yourself and address your question or comment to one or the other of the panelists. Yes, please, yeah. I'm Ankita, project associate at Terry. Uh, Mama, I have a question for you. Uh, how much has DDA, APC, RDA, and other land pooling policies in India have uh, drawn from UN habitat principles? So we have um, we have not um, actively engaged in India yet, but um, but I do see that uh, that there are fundamental um, alignments, you know, um, uh, which is um, which is to um, to look at uh, the, the basic principles of uh, of mixed use and you know uh, design, but uh, but what we do see missing in in the policies here is this uh, is this inclusion right from the very beginning from the design to conceptualization. So at this point, I can't uh, really make any comment on how the UN habitats principles have been adopted or adapted to the context of India. Somebody make up, people make up the mind. Let me ask you a question, Parul. You see, the question of land for land is fraught with a number of problems. That is, you know, the there is always competition for the for the more valuable pieces of land that uh, you know that come up after the land pooling uh, exercise is over. So, what is your view that instead of identifiable parcels of land that the owners are given transferable development rights. 
and so then they essentially are in a market for this transferable development rights and then they are able to partially monetize it in that process or get the uh, land uh, land parcel get the get the, get their land parcels or their you know or their apartments in the in the places where you know which is of most value to them and so on so what do you think of this all right so i can um you know i mean my comment to that question will not be uh, drawn from my experience at un habitat but in my um, other other role um Uh, the transfer of development rights in in bigger cities of uh, you know um i have i've worked in um in new york city so there in the planning um uh, developments where we to- where we talk about land reassembly and other tools um the typical strategy well they have done this they have done this uh, transfer of development rights uh, where property owners are allocated land say in a different borough so it's uh, the city has different parts uh but still that did bring up issues of the social inequity and and the city changed their policy and the court to say well we will allow for tdr but it has to be in the same geographic area so so that would like within the same um um community board which would be a ward equivalent so that the equities of access or the location uh, within the cities are a uh, city is maintained in terms of the benefit of their property Values. Isn't this bigger in the city? I mean, you know, you have a, you have this huge colony, Dobi colony next door, and you know, uh, we'll just forget for the moment that this is a government policy problem. But assume that there were the residents here, and they had property. they had property rights over the land, and you want to redevelop this, and so you give the give the residents, you know, individual transferable development rights. Now. if you insist that it must be in the redeveloped lodi colony uh then you are actually constraining their choices they may say that look you know we want to go elsewhere we want to go where our friends and relatives are we want to go where to our places of work uh why do you want to want to want to keep us you know stranded in lodi colony uh so i don't know you know whether the option that you have said is more equitable or the option of letting people decide for themselves where exactly and how exactly they want to uh want to you know use the tdr some of them might say that look we'll just uh, sell the tdrs and go back to our home villages so in what way is constraining the choice of staying in that same locality you know an improvement for them yeah so no so i mean let me just correct my myself it, i didn't mean that say if, if you have um say like a five acres of land in a in a ward that is 10 or say like 30 acres being developed so so the the principle that cities like new york specifically applies is that you can up, use this anywhere in that 30 acres not necessarily just within that redevelopment area um and that was uh, really done to to uh, fix the prop challenges that uh, people often like to locate uh, in the same area because uh, that's where their uh, jobs are you know that's where they have been living for a long time for the social you know economic uh fabric um i'm i won't be able to comment because i know in india also they have been um um you know test cases where um redevelopment uh, has meant that um that people are allocated again land outside the city boundary city peripheries which creates problem of again access to those centers of employment so i don't have a um you know a, a right or wrong here i think it really depends on the in the context um typically you know there are um there is more um um you know um, uh, there is more attraction to lo- co-locating in that same or similar in that same geography because of uh, because of the concerns of uh, access to uh, jobs but so let me uh... So ask another question while people are making up their minds you see there was talk of developing the dharavi slums you know through a land pooling arrangement but and i think a plan was also developed but i think my impression is that it seems to have got stuck do you have any uh, information about what exactly were the issues that you know have stymied the development of dharavi um i sorry i'm um, yeah no we have not uh, worked in this area on that way okay Uh, I am Madhusudan. 
I just wanted to ask one question. We have been talking about inclusive uh, planning and things like that. So most of all our panelists are talking about it. Now when you talk of inclusive, is there a strategy in how we take it up during the planning itself, even before the design is done, in including the people into the participation process, the engagement plan? How do you take care of that? And is it standard or is there some different strategies you adopt for a larger city, for a different urban agglomeration, or to a smaller town? What is it like? Just wanted to find out. Question for all? Yeah, for all it is actually. Okay. <laughs> I think giving that becomes too diffuse and nobody wants to take it. <laughs> or everybody <laughs> wants to take it. So okay. You better mention one person in the first instance and others can chip in later on. Okay, maybe from the international experience, uh, Parul Bam can give the uh, first uh, thing, then maybe from the Bhutan and Nepal experience, you can understand how they look at it from a smaller uh, town perspective or a hilly region issue like. Yeah. No, so I can I can definitely, you know, speak to that. So, so um, and, and UN system and also specifically in UN Habitat, we speak a lot about the people's process. Um, and what that really means, if I can speak uh, from uh, from my work in in Afghanistan, so even in a country that you, you know we all know the context of the country, it has uh, so many so much difficulty, but it is also transitioning now from from that um, conflict zone into a more re rebuilding reconstruction mode. And and my uh, and the project that I was working on in there was on how do you engage communities and and doing this visioning for their future. Uh, and a lot of lessons in the presentation were also drawn from it. So, so what we have seen is that it is crucial to involve people right from the beginning itself. And, and in the context of Afghanistan, we went the extra mile to say that, uh, uh, that let's create these uh, community uh, development councils, which is again, say like a ward equivalent of what it would be in, in cities in India. But let's have uh, elected representatives from the community to be part of this, um, or two elections to have the community members be part of this team, uh, to uh, and we then uh, took the initiative under this uh, project to train them and to um, give them basic training on what uh, it means to do a development, which meant some quick tools, trainings on on procurement, on financial management, on uh, on designs and and such, and. Um, and and the benefit of doing this engagement from the beginning is is that there is less you know um, uh, less friction and less uh, you know uh, roadblocks uh, later. Um, the redevelopment um, in this case, where also uh, there are uh, underlying questions, especially uh, you know I think that's something that's common, but to uh, different degrees in in countries in in South Asia of who owns the land. So in a country that has been facing wars for thirty years, there are no you know, no land records, but but through this process of engagement, of uh, bringing in and introducing them to the concepts of what land pooling, land readjustment would do uh, to the future, um, and, and to make it uh, may, and, and to make it more inclusive, which is where it's important to uh, make people understand what they will. It's not easy, but I think it is. It is. It it makes a lot of uh, the 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 investment of time to include the people in understanding what they could gain from it uh, pays off very well in, in the end. So now uh, what we have seen through this process of doing these very intensive community visioning exercises uh, right from the beginning, you know, bringing in people, uh, we found during this process that we were not getting a lot of women participants, you know, again, the cultural context. So doing specific focus group meetings with just the women separately trying to understand what are their issues of uh, of access or accessing uh, parks you know public spaces so on so that really motivated people to uh, to uh, to pool in resources again in this context it was not so much in terms of financial resources but then we did see overall in the um, if we just uh, associate costs to uh, you know like do um, to every aspect uh, thirty percent of the costs were borne by the community in kind, you know, so either in contribution through land, through uh, through sex, sweat equity, and and so on. So um, and and that is a model. I feel that if if it can be successful in a place that is <laughs> torn by war, I don't see why you know like uh, it, it it. But but that is my experience of not just in Afghanistan but also in larger cities like New York, uh, who invest a lot of time 
in engaging people in the beginning so that builds the trust with the city departments um in 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 any project that we would do in in bigger cities also in new york we would at least spend 6 to 7 months on just engaging with the community answering their questions on what the projects are so yeah okay as uh, dr parul uh, agrawala is uh, making answer uh, really it is uh, true in our cases also uh, definitely to um, uh, look after these uh, um, land pooling areas or planning areas by town development committee which was formed by mout but that is also through um, election in local areas so it is government body like and another in that area we used to form user committee user committee means uh, the whole body is with all owners of the land and then they elect themselves for executive committee so 11 or 13 people uh, were the executive committee so these committees uh, are um, already there and also uh, government definitely organize different meetings awareness meeting and training and also like uh, you know public hearing and and also they mobilize the community mobilizers to convince people and focus group meeting photo focus, focus group discussion like as already said by agrawala ji that uh, women group uh, even nowadays they separate have meeting with children because uh, children are the main you know ambassador for that house or uh, leader nowadays if children convince parents will be convinced that's why also children's group discussions and and also they know the um, uh, value of land land prices raising everywhere that case studies are enough Uh, to have these, these sort of things that's why people are very happy to even in most of the places people themselves come to the tdf and also the ministry of urban development that please do planning uh, using land pool tooling land pooling tool that's why in our case it is not very problem like in uh, what sharma ji said before it is very success but even i am surprised that even it takes 10 years people are not protesting anything it is very interesting and they are not ge- trying to get something in compensation of that time it is interesting in our case so definitely from the beginning if we involve people uh, then there will be no problem uh, is this question <laughs> answer <laughs> okay thank you is specific to tasi punjab sir sir actually so yeah. i am uh, mr b hazang jang secretary of revenue from meghalaya so i being from a very uh, hilly state sir actually we're a small state from the government of india sir actually our reason is more or le- less similar to what actually i mean in nepal and as well as bhutan and it's quite interesting to know that that, that, that uh, land pooling has been always there in the bhutan uh, for about two decades now is quite old but whereas actually we are yet to uh, start the process so one very interesting i mean if if i'm not mistaken sir to see actually you said ki once that uh, parcel is identified then at least minimum you require we require about a two third majority of the land <coughs> holders now again you said ki i mean after that the remaining one third who has not come into that uh, on the board for land pooling system you go for next stage that is for land acquisition again for the remaining one third so i mean i mean by that uh, are you not getting the impression that actually that uh, if they are not willing to come under that land pooling then i think uh, that land acquisition is the last resort like in in that uh, do we get the impression ki i mean that there is a system in bhutan by way of a land acquisition where i mean the land owners doesn't have much to say 
but then I think they have to come under that acquisition. Just, just for clarification, sir. Well, uh, thank you so much, sir. Indeed, uh, it is also important when you frame a legislation to have a, a common minimum grounds. So in the legislation, the common minimum ground was to have at least a two third majority. In fact, uh, as I reported earlier, there were no instances of uh, having to acquire the remaining one third. It was only to establish in the legislation to have that uh, two third majority. Indeed, uh, maybe because now people are sensitized to the level of uh, having the importance of the importance and the benefit of uh, the particular scheme, land pooling and la land readjustment, whereby there has not been any uh, virtually no resistance from the land owners. But in the event there are, as I represented or as I presented earlier, to to negotiate, to have the negotiation with the landowner through 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 intense uh, deliberations, particularly to, of convincing, while he may have the right uh, to develop on his own piece of plot. That's what I believe. He also have the responsibility to contribute towards the larger good of the community. So individual right versus the larger good of the community needs to be balanced at some point of time. That's what we believe. Hello. I am Thomas. I come from Kerala. I don't represent the government. I'm doing an SA agency, doing an SA for the government and paneled agency. My clarification or comment is uh, inspired by what Mr. Penor has said. They have certain priorities placed, identity priorities, not developmental compulsions only. For example, he said, agriculture, culture, spiritual. That is the identity priority they have placed. Only after that, they are speaking about uh, whether it is pooling or acquisition or whatever. On ground, we have this difficulty when we go to do the SIA in the local place, places. Because there are oppositions. I was involved in the extension of uh, Calicut Airport, and we have not been able to do SIA, opposition from the neighborhood. And they are not raising developmental concerns, more from these concerns. Now, I'm involved in the Shaviri Railway project. It's a railway project, but Shaviri Railway development. Again, there will be some objections from these grounds. And in our discussions on the ground here, more urban areas have been mentioned, not the rural concerns. So I just inspired by what he has said, do we have some certain priorities other than the developmental pressures? And this can be answered even by not only those who are on the panel there. How do we face this challenge? Because for, we could not complete a project because of the concerns the locals have raised with regard to these, not with regard to pressures of development. So this inspired by his presentation, others also may share your uh, uh, experience in this matter of certain priorities other than developmental pressures only. I think it is more in the nature of a comment, but if any of the, uh, any of the panelists would like to respond, you're most welcome. I think everybody is in agreement with what you have said. So, anyone else? Yes, please. Uh, myself, Gautam Singh from Rights Limited. I have a question for, uh, that's, a, that's a query, not a question, I mean, from Sudha ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. He, you said that you have a, uh, you are challenging, facing the challenges of uh, land brokers. So, uh, I mean, how are you dealing with, uh, the, 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 with this challenge particularly? Actually, what happened was uh, these land brokers, they collect land in large piece, and again they will uh, fragment those land in smaller, smaller piece, and they they sell. And from those land, they get very large percentages of benefits. And in that case, if government will develop infrastructure and things, people will be happy on that. So because of these sort of things, they 
used to protest they convince people not to give land to the government and not go for um, planning for using land pulling tool in those cases where i was involved in pokhria that was birgans case it was happened that that brokers protest in 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 the sense of like uh, they convince people not to give because these people are cheating you and such of such type of things they say but i invited them even brokers i invited them and convinced uh, the uh, you know fruitful things of uh, land pulling even uh, those brokers and said if those plots the land owners want to sell then you again can sell because uh, even you can get more price from land and in this matter you know they were convinced and uh, we completed our report and uh, we completed that project but uh, unfortunately it could not be materialized but brokers mostly they feel that if government will develop then they will not able to Uh, get um, you know benefits like anything else and in nepal it is uh, buying and selling is of course the negotiation but here in our country the, those uh, you know brokers they take you know benefit 500 600 times more than the uh, actual price uh, that's thing happening there thank you maybe maybe you are satisfied or not <laughs> uh, oh, yeah just mentioned that the land or land brokers are already they are uh, developing the some infrastructure like road and uh, market areas and they are maximizing the profit they are taking a lot of charging a lot of money for that yeah that, that is, is true that is somewhere they are um, i mean uh, making the profit for themselves not yeah, for the people yeah that type of uh, that type land. of sc- uh, speculations uh, should be minimized yeah and it is very difficult yeah. it's it's very danger danger topics <laughs> thank you so much okay. final question yes i have a question uh, i am preeti das this is directed to parul parul you see that uh, state governments in india and development authorities are going in for land pooling policies coming out with them so why is it that uh, or are they engaging with un habitat because what you have presented the principles etc which are very useful wherever they are applied so what is the level of engagement of indian bodies with un habitat in this regard thank you Yeah, so we have only uh, just uh, recently started engaging with the government. Uh, I mean, our focal ministry is the Ministry of Urban uh, Housing and Urban Affairs. So last year we have worked with them on uh, this national urban planning framework. Yeah, so which is under a draft. It has gone through at least one session of a round of public comments. and if you have, if you uh, you know i would encourage i don't know if it's still online but one of the chapters or on that is on land and that's where we have introduced a lot of these elements that i was talking about on social inclusion on especially the ones that are aligned with uh, sdg 11 around safety resilience sustainability and inclusion uh, throughout the um, throughout the urban development policy uh it's a framework at the national level the idea is to then use this framework uh and uh and customize it as a policy for each state considering ours is such a large country and we can't have one common policy that uh, that would be yeah. uniformly applicable so yeah so i do hope that going forward we will be able to uh to push this uh, more uh strongly yeah we are pretty much out of time and so let us con- conclude this session by uh, thanking all the uh, all the participants uh, shri ravi agarwal uh, who gave the keynote address and then our esteemed pan- panelists uh, mr pl sharma chief town and country planning chief town and country plan ahmedabad mr tashi penjor chief urban plan of bhutan dr suda shrestha head department of architecture tribhuvan university nepal and ms parul agarwala program manager un habitat and all of your presentations uh, have been very insightful i think you know that the uh, the participants in this uh, in this workshop they have benefited a great deal and i hope that you know all your presentations will find due place in the in the conference proceedings that we will uh, we will bring out and also i would like to thank all our audience for listening very patiently to all our presenters and for the very animated 
uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, and meter engaged uh, q and a that has followed so thank you all very much indeed thank you dr ghosh for moderating the session and the speakers for sharing the information with us i would now like dr ghosh to kindly give the token of appreciation to our speakers With the closing of this session, I now invite all the guests to proceed for lunch. We will reassemble for the fourth and final session at 1:45. Once again, I would like to announce to kindly fill the suggestion form and feedback form and kindly submit it at the registration desk. Also, kindly collect the certificates at the end of the day from the registration desk. Thank you. <laughs>